annual salary. Earlier this month, the House Appropriations Subcommittee approved a measure that would increase the salary of future presidents from $200,000 to $400,000 a year, effective in 2001. Earlier today, several former White House chiefs of staff and public policy analysts testified before a House Government Reform Subcommittee. It's about three hours and 15 minutes. It's current level of $200,000 a year. I'm sure that to most Americans, a salary of that amount seems like a lot of money. It is. However, it is the pay for one of the most difficult, demanding, and important jobs on the face of the earth. The president's salary, unchanged in three decades, serves as a ceiling for almost every other salary in the federal government. I said almost every other salary, because as will be discussed during this hearing, it could soon be surpassed by a limited number of government officials. This hearing is not about whether President Clinton should get a pay raise. The Constitution prohibits presidential pay changes until the end of the current president's term in office. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution states, the President shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation, which shall neither be increased nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected, and he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. In other words, the President's salary cannot be changed during his term in office. The effect of that prohibition is that if no action is taken before the next president is sworn into office, he or she could be paid less than the vice president. Vice President Gore, as well as the Chief Justice of the United States and the Speaker of the House, currently earn $175,400 a year. These officials also receive cost of living adjustments to their salaries. As we will hear today, the Vice President, the Chief Justice, and the Speaker of the House could earn each more than the President before the next presidential term ends in 2005. When President George Washington took office in the year 1789, the salary of the President was established at $25,000 a year. At that time, jo President John Adams earned $5,000 a year, Vice President John Adams. Chief Justice John Jay earned $4,000 a year, and members of the President's Cabinet made $3,500 a year. According to computations made by the Congressional Research Service, by one measure, President Washington's $25,000 salary equates to more than $4.5 million today. Now, a number of the witnesses have made that calculation, and I was reminded of President Truman's great comment that uh, I want a uh, one-armed uh, economist here because they're always saying on the one hand or the other hand and he was tired of listening to it and we have several figures in the record today but in any case we know that it was substantial and four and a half million is certainly one of those on uh, May 14th the Appropriations Subcommittee on Treasury Postal Service and General Government included a provision in the Treasury Appropriations Bill that would increase the president's salary to four hundred thousand dollars effective January 20, 2001. The full Committee on Appropriations is expected to act on this recommendation shortly. And at today's hearing, we will hear from the most distinguished assortment of witnesses who will testify about whether the President's salary should be changed. Before I introduce the first panel, I'll yield to the ranking member, Mr. Turner of Texas, for an opening statement. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's interesting to note that when uh, Babe Ruth was asked in the early 1930s how in the world he could ask for a higher salary than President Hoover's, he replied, I had a better year than he did. And of course that was true because Babe Ruth had 46 home runs in 1929 and Hoover presided over the uh, crash of the stock market. I guess that's a humorous example of, of uh, problems inherent in trying to compare private sector pay with uh, the president's salary. Uh, clearly, uh, the factors considered while negotiating the salary of a baseball player differ significantly for those, from those considered in setting the president's. Uh, nonetheless, it is true that the salaries of typical chief executive officers in this country are increasing rapidly, while the salary of our president uh, remains static. People enter public service, of course, for reasons other than financial compensation, as 
all of us understand. Uh, clearly, individuals with qualifications and contacts to be elected as president could garner extremely high salaries in the competitive business market, yet they choose not to do so. Presidents run for office because they believe in making a difference and improving the lives of American citizens. In fact, President George Washington announced that he would forego his constitutional compensation, declaring that his sense of duty required him to serve the country without pay. Congress didn't allow him to do so, however, and uh, passed a statute setting his pay at $25,000 per year. John Page of Virginia stated at the time, the Constitution requires that the President shall receive compensation, and it's our duty to provide it. The constitutional intent is to assure the financial independence of the President so that he would not be impover impoverished and not be susceptible to corruption, which might jeopardize the public interest. Alexander Hamilton noted in the Federalist Papers, power over a man's support is power over his will. The restriction against increasing the president's salary during an administration ensures that the Congress cannot influence the president by appealing to his avarice. Certainly the past concerns of our founding fathers remain true today, and the question of whether the current level of salary would likely make the president susceptible to corrupt influences should be explored. The prospect of the vice president's salary overtaking that of the president will also be discussed. And there is reason uh, to learn the lessons of history on this point as well. While the Constitution said nothing about the vice president's salary, it did create the office, and the first Congress made it clear that some compensation was necessary. Fisher Ames, one of the first members of Congress, suggested that if competent support is not allowed for the vice president, the choice will be confined to opulent characters. This is an arist uh, aristocratic idea and contravenes, I think, the spirit of the Constitution. When a House committee proposed to pay the Vice President 5,000 a year, John White of Virginia objected to the princely sum, and Representative Page responded that he would never have created the office of Vice President, but since we've got him, he said, we must maintain him. From these comments, we can draw two additional important conclusions. First, the salary provided to the President and the Vice President, and indeed to all high-level federal officials, should be adequate to maintain qualified individuals. And secondly, the salary should allow for those who are not independently wealthy to serve in these positions. I think these two simple principles should guide us in our consideration of the President's compensation the assurance that a president's financial condition will not make him or her susceptible to corruption, and the allowance for those who are qualified and not independently wealthy to hold office if so elected or appointed. Having said that, I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to the distinguished panel that you have gathered here before us today. I thank the gentleman, and uh, let me just uh, note the way the procedure will follow. The witnesses will be have been arranged so that the uh, earliest, shall we say, of the group uh, in the Johnson administration would be the first witness, and the last in the group will be the current administration. I will do an introduction on each one of you before you speak. Uh, this is an investigating subcommittee of the full Committee on Government Reform and uh, our tradition is to swear in all witnesses. So you've taken the oath many times. And uh, if you all will stand, we'll swear you in and then begin. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that all the witnesses have affirmed the oath. And uh, we will begin with the first uh, one from the Johnson administration, Ambassador James R. Jones. Now, when I introduce you, your full statement is automatically part of the record and any attachments you want to add to it. And then uh, we'd like to have mostly a dialogue when you're all done. And uh, if you'd like to summarize, we would not be offended by that. Uh, Ambassador Jones, a number of us have known for 30 years. He was a member of Congress. And I remember when I was in education, he did a wonderful job uh, to uh, help get the budget moving for higher education in this country. 
and he began his career at the White House, which was very unusual. Usually it's a more senior person that begins the career there after they're 30 or 40 or 50. He graduated from law school and then became staff assistant to President Lyndon Johnson. At the age of 28, he was appointed special assistant and appointment secretary to the president. He was the youngest person to ever hold that post. After leaving the White House, he represented his Oklahoma congressional district for seven terms in the House of Representatives. While a member of the House, he served as chairman of the Budget Committee and a member of the Ways and Means Committee, the most prestigious committee in the House, and the one that goes back the furthest in our constitutional history. He was then appointed ambassador to Mexico in 1993, and during his four-year ambassadorship, Mexico faced serious economic crisis with the devaluation of the peso, and other economic challenges involving implementation of the North Atlantic Fair Tr Trade Agreement, otherwise known as NAFTA. The ambassador has been honored by both the United States and the Mexican governments for his leadership, and we welcome you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, to what was once your home here, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for giving me an opportunity to testify in brief uh, let me just state that the proposal to double the president's salary to $400,000 is something I totally support. I will tell you, in my 14 years of Congress, this is the first time I've had to take the oath of, uh, to, uh, to testify to that pay raise uh, proposal, but I do so with the, it's a great honor to do so. Uh, basically, there are two or three reasons why I think the committee and the Congress should move rapidly and uh, approve this proposal. Uh, in the last budget of the Johnson administration 31 years ago was contained the last time the president received a pay raise, which took effect the first year of President Nixon's administration. And it is high time after 30 years that it be revisited uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, number one is the symbolism of the respect we have for that office. Having been in the private sector now for several years since uh, leaving the Congress, I can tell you that the President's salary would rank at about uh, mid-level management of an average uh, company in the United States. And if you raised it to $400,000, it would be about equivalent to the CEO's salary of a mid-level uh, uh, company in the United States. Now, as was said by Mr. Turner, people don't go into public service for the salary, for the wages, the benefits. You go in to serve. But the fact of the matter is, in this country, particularly with business having such a, a dominant uh, part of our lives, people do uh, respect or not respect an office based upon what we consider that office is worth to the person that holds it. So for the first reason, I think it, it should be raised. Secondly, there are expenses. Uh, incurred when you're president. And uh, those expenses are both inside and living in the White House, in addition to what is provided to the president, but also in maintaining uh, your outside activities, whether you had a home previously, previously, or payments for education, all the things that go with a, with a normal family. And I think that uh, the, the presidents have those expenses, and even if uh, most presidents can fully afford to pay them themselves. Uh, there ought to be some recognition that those who cannot should be able to be president and meet their expenses. The final reason that I think is very important is the effect that the president's salary has on other uh, incomes. Uh, I have served as a member of Congress, as you say, and as an ambassador, and as a member of Congress virtually every year, every month, uh, we took a sigh of relief and say we made it over the line. My wife and I were able to educate our kids, et cetera, without having to borrow a lot of money, et cetera. Uh, as an ambassador, I'd had time in the private sector and was able to afford the fact that most ambassadors have to go into their personal resources to meet the regular expenses of running an embassy and representing the United States. I think that's clearly true of most people in public office. And if the president's uh, salary is not raised, as was pointed out in your opening remarks, uh, other incomes of high-level officials in, in our federal government will start bumping up or exceeding the president's salary, and there will be no opportunity for another four years uh, to raise that and uh, to 
uh, raise the other salaries. I personally think that if you, and again, it's, I'm not an economist, but if you took uh, the salaries of all federal officials from the president throughout, including members of Congress, at the uh, time they were established and brought them forward with nothing more than cost of living adjustments, also adjusting for times of depression when you have a, a depreciation, uh, everyone in the federal government would be substantially underpaid on that particular scale. Uh, so I think uh, the, the effect that it has on the salaries of other federal officials of, of holding the line of the president's salary is terribly important because we do want to attract the most competent, the best people we can to, to public service. And uh, m when you have to have sometimes two homes, et cetera, and all the expenses of living, uh, you need to pay those competent people what they're worth. I thank you very much, Ambassador, and we will now introduce General Alexander M. Haig, Jr. Very long and distinguished career that most Americans know about. Uh, he served more than three decades in the United States Army. He rose to be a four-star general. Uh, it, it, that included tours in Japan, Korea, Europe, and Vietnam, highly decorated for all of the posts he held in the military. And in 1969, he was assigned to the staff of Dr. Henry Kissinger, then the assistant to the President for National Security Affairs in the Nixon administration. During that tenure in the White House, General Haig made about 14 trips to Southeast Asia on behalf of the President to negotiate the Vietnam ceasefire and the return of U.S. prisoners of war. He resigned from the military service when President Nixon appointed him White House Chief of Staff. General Haig remained in that position until 1974 when President Ford recalled him to active duty as Commander-in-Chief of the United States European Command and later as Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. Two years after he retired from the Army, General Haig became the nation's 59th Secretary of State in the cabinet of President Ronald Reagan. We welcome you, General. We look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Chairman Horn. I want to compliment the uh, subcommittee for holding these very timely uh, sessions, which uh, I think are o both overdue and I hope will result in action. Uh, now, the only complaint I have is you should put me here because I sat uh, alongside General Douglas MacArthur during his telecom discussions with Harry Truman at the time of the North Korean invasion of South Korea. So I go back through eight presidents uh, seven whom I serve fairly closely, four at probably intimate range. Uh, the most uh, learning experience I think I got with President Nixon 18 years during Watergate. Uh, but I did serve uh, with Bob Hartman here on the transition of uh, President Ford. I served uh, President Kennedy as a member of his Cuban Coordinating Committee where a lot of nefarious actions took place that are only recently being written about. Uh, I also uh, served as Pentagon liaison to the Johnson administration and knew President Johnson well and admired him greatly. So beyond that, uh, as NATO commander, President Ford and, of course, President Carter, I met monthly, so I think I knew some of their travails. And, of course, I was Secretary of State for President Reagan. Now, all these gentlemen here bear scar tissue but I think I have the largest <laughs> load of it. Now, having said that, I would heartily endorse everything Ambassador Jones said, and I'm not going to repeat any of that. I will say that I think today the presidency is more unique, more challenging, and more complex than it has ever been historically. And in that context, what I mean to say is that uh, presidents are learning they don't have the luxury of choosing between foreign affairs and domestic affairs in the conduct of their office. As the last two presidents have learned, both starting on a different syllable, uh, you've got to deal with both foreign affairs and domestic affairs simultaneously, and you can't succeed in one uh, if you fail in the other. So that's a lesson which has added to the complication in a world in which globalization is is the character of this world. Uh, secondly, is the impact of the explosion of information sciences on the institution of the presidency. 
Uh, today, the president lives in real time. Whether it's video or voice, people demand answers almost instantaneously to every national crisis that develops or any international crisis that develops. Now, needless to say, this has not had a, what I call a complimentary impact on the institution of the presidency. It means uh, he has got to proceed almost real time to make decisions on things that should be thought about for weeks, if not months. And it leads to what I call mis calculations and misjudgments by our chief executive. Uh, secondly, I think it has developed a, a new flavor to the office of the presidency. It's produced the modern populist, the guy that has to run for office with his finger to the wind, rather than with the principles and values uh, alone which brought him into the, the job he, he is performing. Now, having said all that, uh, I can tell you as a former chief executive or chief operating officer of the, one of our Fortune 500 multinational companies that uh, government pay is very, very poor, no matter what the office. And today, the thought of a vice president or a chief justice or someone else exceeding in pay the president of the United States is just simply unacceptable. Now. To give you an idea, when I was with United Technologies, I left command of five million active and reserve troops in Europe. And I took a 20-fold pay increase to move from four-star general to the chief operating officer of United Technology. Had I stayed and been successful, today I would be being paid over three and a half million dollars in annual salary. Uh, and hundreds of millions of dollars in stock options, to say nothing of a retirement bill built on about $20, billion, $20 million of uh, interest producing revenue, which is guaranteed and insured. So we know we can't pay presidents in accordance with their unique job requirements. There's no tougher job in the world than the presidency of the United States not just head of state, it's head of government. So operations and values and heritage and all mingled in the one thing, and if you fail, you fail, and you're the guy that's held responsible. And when Truman said the buck stops here, he wasn't kidding. Uh, I don't think we can match what presidents earn. And we know presidents don't do the job because of the emoluments that it, it brings. But I do think we have to guarantee the dignity of the individual. And that means his clothing, his family requirements, the education of his children if he has them. And above all, we shouldn't put in jeopardy what assets he brings to the office. I served one of these presidents who left $400,000 in debt. Uh, just paying the legal fees that sometimes accompany the modern presidency. So I think we've got to move and move promptly. And in that sense, uh, I would strongly recommend that we go even above the Appropriations Committee salary to a level, level of $500,000, which is roughly peanuts compared to comparable uh, commercial salaries. Uh, if, that, if this committee believes that it would be quicker and a bipartisan consensus could be developed and it would be more efficiently done than 400,000 is better than nothing. But uh, that would be my feeling. And I also believe that the legislature, the Congress, has got to look at the president's retirement pay, which is also less by a large measure than what it should be. And finally, I would suggest that these uh, benefits or allowances be reviewed uh, in the third term of every presidency to be sure that the, the dynamics of our economy are keeping pace with its just fundamental requirements. That's my feeling, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, General. Uh, we now uh, move to Mr. Robert T. Hartman, 
highly acclaimed reporter and writer before his 1974 appointment by President Gerald Ford as counselor to the President. Uh, during his tenure in the cabinet level position, Mr. Hartman participated in White House policy making sessions, accompanied the President on numerous campaign trips and visits to Europe, the Far East and Soviet Union. In addition, Mr. Hartman oversaw the research correspondence writing staffs at the White House, personally drafted and edited most of President Ford's statements and speeches. Before joining the President's staff, Mr. Hartman spent more than two decades as a journalist for the Los Angeles Times, and he was the Washington bureau head here in the late 50s uh, and 60s. And before he became the Times Washington bureau chief, uh, he covered Congress and the White House, later established the newspaper's Mediterranean and Middle East Bureau in Rome, Italy, and throughout his career in journalism, Mr. Hartman has received numerous honors for his reporting and writing, and we're glad to welcome you today, Mr. Hartman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I uh, want to add uh, that uh, although I, President Ford's term as president was one of the shortest in our history. Uh, I, I hope to approach this subject from a somewhat broader perspective than that of the White House, because I did spend a great deal of time uh, covering the Hill and uh, working on the Hill when he was the uh, minority leader of the Congress and the House. Now, when I arrived uh, here in Washington, uh, the year was 1954, it was a sort of general understanding that I was going to be paid about the same as a member of Congress. Now, th at that time, this sum was $22,500. President Eisenhower got 100000 The Chief Justice, our former California governor, Earl Warren got 35,005, and Vice President Nixon, also a Californian, was uh, cut $500 on that and got 35,000 even. I expect that annoyed him quite a bit. I detail all this to make the point that uh, has already been made, as a matter of fact, that uh, federal salaries and indeed salaries other than federal salaries in Washington particularly uh, depend on the president's pay. And the president's pay and the pay of other federal officials help set the benchmarks for almost everybody else in town. Now, a dozen years after I got here and served as chief of the Times Washington Bureau, I went to work for Jerry Ford. I, well, and he was, had just been elected chairman of, uh, the, the, uh, just been elected minority leader, and he and a group of young, relatively young uh, Republican congressmen uh, hoped to create <coughs> a, a new and more vigorous and more progressive image for their party than uh, was represented by uh, Charlie Halleck and Ev Dirksen, uh, who appeared on television every week to conduct the uh, Ev and Charlie show, as it was called. Now, uh, Ford uh, had just succeeded Halleck, and he was waging an uphill battle trying to get equal time with Dirksen, which wasn't easy. And I didn't uh, volunteer to offer to help win that one. But we did shift the battlefield by challenging President Johnson himself at every opportunity. And we demanded uh, equal time from the networks to put on a reply or rebuttal to the, uh, the President's annual State of the Union message. I must add that I was in no way responsible for the public's prompt abbreviation of uh, our constructive Republican alternative proposals. Uh, now, if I may offer a few thoughts about how we should pay our presidents. Some of them have already been uttered, but I can't revise my script now. <laughs> uh, first, you can never match 
his or her salary, that is the president, to the depth and degree of responsibility that he carries in that job. It is a totally consuming responsibility without any equal of which I am aware, and of a magnitude which can be appreciated only perhaps by another president. Second, the compensations of the office are considerable, but money is really only a minor one of them. Power, perks, pensions, protection, and a place in history loom much larger than most presidents' minds. As the minority leader in the House, Congressman Ford was debating Vice President Hubert Humphrey before the Gridiron Club's annual dinner, and he assured Humphrey that he had absolutely no designs on the vice presidency. Nevertheless, he admitted, every evening as he drove by the White House on his way home, he heard a small voice saying to him, if you lived here, you'd be home now. <laughs> I expect he's still using that joke. Uh, 1969, after the president had remained at $100,000 for two decades, Congress doubled it to $200,000 and fixed its own at $42,500. This gave me a welcome $6,500 raise as Ford's assistant on the Hill here, and it raised almost everybody else. Now, after 30 years, you're considering another doubling to 400000 because the salaries of other federal officials, not limited by the Constitution, are pushing upward on the chief executives. I won't say that public servants, as we love to style ourselves, are poorly paid, or that their pensions are miserly. As Richard Nixon was wont to say, that would not be right. But with regard to the question before you today, it is not primarily about the next president's pay. It is about everybody's pay who works for the government. If I may uh, paraphrase uh, a, wa a wise old paraphrase, we have seen the government, and it is us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much. We appreciate your comments. Our next uh, representative is well known in Washington. Mr. Kenneth M. Duberstein is chairman and chief executive of the Duberstein Group, and uh, he served as chief of staff to President Ronald Reagan. Uh, since then, I might say he's regarded as probably the or one of the most effective advocates on Capitol Hill. So uh, he learned a lot, and he brings a great deal of experience to this particular panel. Prior to assuming the post in 1987, Mr. Duberstein had served as an advisor to the President on legislative affairs. Although he came from the private sector, he was no stranger to public service. And from 1972 to 1976, he held the position of Director of Congressional Intergovernmental Affairs for the General Services Administration, later served as Deputy Undersecretary of Labor during the Ford Administration. He was awarded the President's Citizen Medal by President Reagan in 1989. And as well as presiding over his Washington-based consulting firm, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Affairs and Foreign Relations and serves on the Board of Governors of the American Stock Exchange and Vice Chairman of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, one of the great centers of performing arts in our nation. We're glad to welcome you back and look forward to your testimony, Mr. Duberstein. Thank you, Chairman Horn, uh, Congressman Turner. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's a privilege to be on this panel with so many distinguished colleagues, all of whom were taller, much taller, before each served as the White House Chief of Staff. I am pleased to testify today strongly in favor of a long overdue substantial salary increase to $400,000 for the next President of the United States. This is not even a close call, Mr. Chairman. This needs to be addressed now. It is a case of simple equity. 
This is not about a president. This is about the presidency. This is about the compensation of the leader of the free world, not about the salary of the chief of a not very well-run small startup company or the head of a third world country. This is about our chief executive officer, not the retired chairman of the board who has been put out to pasture. This is about the stature and prestige of the leader of the government of the United States and the person charged with truly awesome responsibilities here at home and throughout the world. To put this in some perspective, the salary of the President of the United States has not been increased since those long ago days when the Dow Jones average was below 1,000, Neil Armstrong had not yet walked on the moon, the amazing Mets had won their first World Series, Strom Thurmond was a mere child of 66, Charles de Gaulle was president of France, and Golda Meir was the prime minister of Israel. It was the age of Aquarius, before Woodstock, before the Concord's maiden flight and construction of Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. It was a much easier time before C-SPAN, cable TV, the internet, and 24-hour continuous news cycles. No one should run for the presidency for the money, but it deserves remuneration well beyond public housing, public transportation, and maid service. Keeping up with the inflation alone since 1969 should result in a sizable pay increase. I support strongly, Mr. Chairman, the proposal for a $400,000 salary for the President. I am concerned, as other members of the panel have stated as well, with the pay compression for senior executive service personnel, as well as, well as for the Vice President, the Chief Justice, and others. I hope this committee and the Congress will move expeditiously to increase the salary of the presidency beginning in January 2001. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, our next speaker is probably fairly widely known across the country. That's Governor John H. Sununu, a former governor of New Hampshire. He served as Chief of Staff to President George Bush from 1989 to 1991. In his high-level advisory position, he oversaw the daily operations of the White House and its staff. He also served as Counselor to the President, remains a member of the Board of Trustees for the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation. Before joining the President's staff, Governor Sununu served three consecutive terms as New Hampshire's 93rd Governor. He gained regional and national recognition as chairman of the Coalition of Northeastern Governors, chairman of the Republican Governors Association, and chairman of the National Governors Association. From 1968 until 1973, the governor who holds a doctorate degree in mechanical engineering from uh, probably our leading institution in science and engineering, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, served as associate dean of the College of Engineering at Tufts, and Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering. So he's had experience in the academic world, which some would say is tougher than the political world uh, because uh, they never forget. But uh, he took the easy route. He elected himself three times as governor of New Hampshire, and he follows in a great tr tradition of one Sherman Adams, who was also a great governor of New Hampshire and chief of staff to President Eisenhower. Welcome, Governor Sununu. Thank you very much, Chairman Horn. Mr. Turner, uh, I too appreciate this opportunity to talk about an issue that I, I do believe is a very significant one. Uh, I have no disagreement with the, any of the comments made by my colleagues on the panel. Um, I, I just want to emphasize a couple of points and then make one what I hope is, is an additional point for your consideration. Uh, 
Chairman, the four and a half million dollars that uh, the twenty-five thousand dollar salary that George Washington received in 1789 represents merely a two and a half percent inflation rate on an annual basis, and as we look around at uh, historic uh, inflation rates, we realize that we are patting ourselves on the back when we keep it that low. So it is an underestimate of what that might have been scaled up to if, if it had continued to be scaled in a fair way. I think it's important to recognize, though, that the issue before you, uh, if we look at it in economic terms, we would come with these huge salaries. But you uh, are sensitive, as, as uh, I think all of us here on the panel have to be sensitive, to the fact that we are talking about a political issue. And therefore, I believe that you will be forced and, in fact, will have to examine the level of this salary in the context of what is politically acceptable to the public of the United States at this time. And, and therefore, um, in, in the paper I presented uh, as my uh, prepared remarks, I, I had a number in there which was selected before you focused on the 400,000. I suggested a number of 500,000. But I can wholeheartedly endorse the $400,000 that you are examining as a specific increase. But the second point I'd like to make <clears throat> is that I do suggest that one of the problems we have reached this position of a lack of equity is that the re review and the change of the salary of the President of the United States has occurred, in fact, too infrequently. And therefore, I would recommend to the committee that they seek a way to establish in law a statutory review period which would require the Congress not to raise the salary on a periodic basis, but to review the salary for the possibility of raising it on a periodic basis. And I would suggest that a statutory obligation of an eight or 12 year <coughs> period be established for that review. Uh, I would suggest that with the obligation of review on that periodic basis, and what we would hope would be a series of enlightened Congresses that would follow, uh, that over a period of time, the salary that is politically acceptable would begin to approach one that is ex uh, economically appropriate for this, which is argu arguably the, the position of, of responsibility which deserves probably the highest salary uh, of anyone in the world. Uh, it is, I think, that mechanism uh, which I, I present for your consideration, which could begin to alleviate the, the historic disparity that seems to exist in the salary of the President uh, and, and comparable levels of responsibility around the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Samuel K. Skinner, who served President George Bush both as the President's Chief of Staff and as Secretary of Transportation. As a senior aide to the President, Mr. Skinner coordinated the President's activities and managed the White House staff. During his service in the President's Cabinet, Mr. Skinner was responsible for overseeing the Department of Transportation's $30 billion budget and 105,000 employees. He's been credited with numerous successes in transportation policy, including the development of the President's national transportation policy and passage of the landmark aviation and surface transportation legislation. Mr. Skinner also developed the administration's open skies policy, which liberalized the nation's international aviation policy and significantly increased the number of international flights to and from the United States. We welcome you, Mr. Skinner, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> uh, Congressman Turner. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, as uh, one of the latest to serve as uh, uh, Chief of Staff to the, uh, uh, to the President. Uh, I also uh, think I can bring a little different perspective uh, to this discussion, because while I agree with every, what everybody has said, uh, I've had the opportunity to be in and out of government on several occasions in 1968. Uh, as a salesman at IBM, making $50,000 a year, I left to join public service for $7,500 a year with a wife and three children. Uh, some would say that was foolish, but it was clearly uh, one of the best things I ever did in my life. I think any comparison uh, of corporate salaries or private sector income uh, to the salary of the President of the United States is basically irrelevant. Uh, you don't do it for the money the benefits and, and the rewards that you get uh, go well beyond that. Uh, and while there is great disparities, I think there will continue to be disparities. I do, however, think that the, the standard that we have to set 
uh, deals with uh, basically two factors. Number one, we should not have a salary that is so low that people who are serving in government who have not had the opportunity to go in and out of government will not be able to serve as president or offer themselves as a candidate for president because they have no money and it is an impossible to meet the requirements absent compromising one's integrity uh, or going uh, without. Uh, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. I can afford to educate those children because my wife and I both work. Most people in government today, <clears throat> many of them in, the, in this room and others, come from a family where both couples work. It's very hard for the spouse of a president to work. So if you take those two incomes together, we may actually require a family to take a cut from current, stand, current salaries and compensation to serve as president if they don't have independent income. A president needs to educate his children or her children. Uh, to put money away for education today is no small challenge unless you have independent wealth. In Illinois, as I left today, the schools in Illinois, and, and, and President Horn would f be familiar with this, they all announced they were raising their tuition in the state by about 5 percent, and one raised the tuition 15 percent. Tuition is increasing at a rate greater than the rate of inflation. Uh, and our president should have the right and the ability to at least send his children to college uh, with some assistance. Uh, as well. And finally, we should avoid uh, the appearance of impropriety uh, and the idea that a president uh, should have to, to accept gratuities or put hi himself or herself in a situation uh, where they have to take dresses or gifts or suits or ties uh, or free tuition or anything like that to make ends meet uh, is not uh, what we want the president uh, to find themselves in that situation. Uh, he must meet, he or she must meet basic individual needs, personal living expenses, and they're greater than normal Americans. Uh, and number two, he should be able or she should be able to conduct themselves in their office without worrying every moment about how they're going to meet basic financial needs. Uh, and finally, Obviously, when you raise the president's salary every 30 years, uh, unless we're going to change the mechanism, as Governor Sununu suggests, which I think is worthy of serious consideration, you've got to bump it up at a level sufficient enough uh, so that uh, we don't find ourselves in the same situation without uh, any kind of remedy five years from now. Uh, what that amount is uh, is somewhat controversial. Uh, I've been conducting my own independent poll the last several days, and while I don't live my life by polls, uh, I asked, I read my remarks to my wife, and I suggested $500,000 to my wife, and she reminded me that that was a substantial amount of money, that a lot of other people were making that money, and, and that, you know, that it might not be acceptable politically uh, or practical. Uh, I then had the opportunity to, to, to fly uh, last week, this weekend, with a distinguished public servant who will remain anonymous because he may run for elected office or re-election again, uh, but he suggested the number of $500,000. Uh, and then, of course, I flew out this morning and conducted the final leg of the poll, which was a management consultant who serves both in government and private sector. And uh, ironically, he came up with the number of 500000 which Governor Sununu had mentioned in his earlier remarks. The point is, uh, it is a very politically sensitive number, uh, but if you're going to do it, uh, let's do it in a way that accomplishes what we want to accomplish, and that is allow the president to serve and others to run for the presidency and meet their basic minimal expenses of a personal nature as well as their family educational expenses, lift it high enough so that we can really avoid the wage compression that exists uh, for other government officials who are similarly situated. Uh, and number three, uh, put it at a level uh, that will be acceptable uh, to the American people. I believe they understand uh, 
the need uh, for a significant change. And, and I applaud this committee for the political strength it takes to even have this hearing, let alone take a position on what can be a very controversial issue. Uh, and uh, I welcome your questions. Thank you very much for those thoughtful comments. Our last panelist is Thomas F. Mac McLarty III. He uh, is well known on Capitol Hill and highly respected by members in both parties in his uh, uh, initial job in the Clinton administration as Chief of Staff and then Counselor to the President and then Special Envoy for the Americas. After joining the White House as President Clinton's Chief of Staff, Mr. McLarty helped enact the 1993 Deficit Reduction Package, the North Atlantic Fair Trade Agreement, Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and the Family and Medical Leave Law, which didn't quite get uh, eliminated, I mean, or passed. In 1994, Mr. McLarty organized the Summit of the Americas in Miami. He played a critical role in structuring the 1995 Mexican Peso Stabilization Program. And in his role as Special Envoy for the Americas, Mr. McLarty made more than 50 trips to the region, planned U.S. participation in the 1998 Summit of the Americas in Santiago. In addition, he's participated in several G7 summits and traveled to the Persian Gulf on the President's behalf to build financial support for the Bosnian peace process. Before his White House tenure, Mr. McLarty served as Arkansas State uh, Legislature at the age of 23, which is probably the all-time record, and as chairman of the Arkansas State Democratic Party, and also the chairman of one of the major utilities in Arkansas. We welcome you, Mr. McLarty. Look forward to your testimony. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, Congressman Turner. <clears throat> it is certainly a privilege for me to appear before you today for this very timely very important hearing, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to do so, particularly uh, with my distinguished colleagues from previous administrations. It is an honor to uh, serve one's country, and we do not and should not expect any of us to profit or become rich from government service. But sometimes I wonder if we're having the opposite effect. Secretary Bob Rubin used the joke that the only way to leave Washington with a small fortune is to arrive with a large one. And while I'm not worried about Mr. Rubin's personal finances, <laughs> his uh, humor, I think, uh, has a ring of truth to it. Mr. Chairman, as you noted, I am a product of the private sector, both from a third generation family business endeavor, which we are still active in, and having the privilege to serve as chairman and chief executive of a publicly traded Fortune 500 natural gas company before I came to Washington. I am truly grateful for the opportunity to serve the people of our country, but I think it is fair to say that opportunity costs are high and they are increasing. And I am worried that we are attracting fewer citizens who have proven successful careers in private life to serve our country. This committee has documented a number of concerns about the effect of a fixed presidential salary. Lloyd Cutler, who served with distinction both in the Clinton administration and the Carter administration, led a commission uh, 10 years ago that recommended the president's salary be raised to $350,000. Congressman Jim Colby's committee, I believe, has suggested an increase by the year 2001 <coughs> to $400,000, a figure that we have discussed today. While I was privileged to serve President Bush on two presidential commissions and, of course, serve President Clinton in the White House, my primary concern is not about the personal income of them or any future president, although I think that's important. My colleagues have pointed out the reasons very eloquently and thoughtfully. But I am particularly concerned about the fixed presidential salary compressing the wages for others who serve in the public sector. And that goes from the civil service the military, General Haig, and certainly to political appointees. I think all of us would agree very strongly that the best government is one that attracts talented people from all walks of life. You certainly should not have to be independently wealthy to serve in government. But we have raised the cost of serving in government rather dramatically. The detailed filings that we all have to make for appointed positions can literally cost thousands upon thousands of dollars. You have to sever existing business relations, which others have spoken of, and I think that's proper. But I think these are very real costs, including the cost of relocation, that should be included when we evaluate 
government service. In short, whether it be career civil servants, our men and women in uniform, or the people who serve in appointed offices, all of these people are real American families with mortgages and tuitions and all of the other challenges of modern life. And the bottom line is that private sector salaries are increasing and government salaries are not. And we should really not put people in position of making a difficult choice between their family and their country. Now, Congressman Turner has already suggested that it was big news when Babe Ruth earned more than the president, and I'm not suggesting that we should pay presidents as much as major league athletes or even CEOs. That is not the real reason one seeks public service. But I do think, as it has been pointed out, that the president's salary should reflect the importance the American people place on this job. As you have noted, Mr. Chairman, the President's salary has been fixed since the Johnson administration. There are a number of calculations we can make, including the George Washington calculation. But if we adjusted for the gross domestic product from 1969, we'd have a salary of about $1.7 million. If we did that on a per capita basis, it would be about $1.3 million. A more modest suggestion is the President's salary should increase along with average hourly wages. Other measures might reflect inflation or the size of the economy, but no measure perhaps reflects the importance of the connection of the President to American families. Since 1969, the last time the President's salary was changed, average hourly wages have increased 425 percent, and that would equate to about $850,000. Now, again, I'm not wedded to any one number. I fully support the $400,000 figure that has been talked about in the appropriation bill, and perhaps a larger number is justified. And I think it is an appropriate one for the challenge and the responsibility and the demands that we make uh, on public uh, people that serve in public life today. Mr. Chairman, common sense, I think, tells us that presidential salaries should not be fixed for 30 years. Fairness suggests that we end the pay compression for other public servants, and the economic reality is that government competes with the private sector for talent and experience, and we should recognize that. I commend you and this committee for holding this hearing on a very important matter, and I hope Congress will move forward to address this issue in a timely fashion. Thank you. Well, we thank you for your very helpful remarks. Let me just go down, have you all having heard each colleague, I would like to start with Ambassador Jones and say, uh, did anybody convince you here that you ought to move from 400,000 to 500,000? <laughs> That's one part of the question. The other is Governor Sununu's point of we should have a system that reviews this on an automatic basis of either uh, every two terms or 10 years or 15 years, whatever. In the case of uh, the Controller General of the United States, for example, he gets one salary and that salary follows him into retirement. He has a 15-year term, et cetera. And we haven't got into retirement yet, but uh, we will. But uh, let's start with you, Ambassador. And, well, on uh, both of those points, uh, I would opt for a higher level of, of salary increase to at least 500000 but recognizing, as the others have, the political difficulties, uh, 400000 would be the minimum. As far as the, an annual review, I think Governor Sununu makes a very good recommendation, and at least uh, as we review the census every 10 years, uh, we ought to review uh, presidential salaries and the impact of that salary. Christine. Uh, I would uh, support 500000 but my vote isn't the one that's important. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you have to look both at the American people and at your colleagues in the Congress of whether doubling to 400,000 mm -hmm. is more politically feasible than 500. On the second issue, on John's uh, suggested review, the Quadrennial Commission is not charged with the responsibility for a president's salary, but certainly looking forward every four years. I think makes uh, the ultimate sense, as Al Haig said, in the third year of a president, looking forward to the next presidential term. And so I would strongly support a regular review of presidential salaries. Okay, Governor. 
I, I support, uh, I came in to propose 500,000. I yielded to the 400,000 you had, but if you twist my arm, I'll go back to 500,000. <laughs> Uh, I do. I don't have any uh, argument with utilizing an existing mechanism like the Quadrennial com Commission or, or whatever. I picked eight years or 12 years as a period because uh, uh, thinking in terms of either two or three presidential terms. But whatever the period is, I think it would <coughs> go a long way to, to regularizing the process, and that's the key to it. Okay. Mr. Skinner, you started all this with all I, that, I certainly with that did. vast universe of polling that you uh, <laughs> well, told uh, you know where I stand. Uh, I, I would say that if you're going to set a mechanism in place, which I uh, agree should be set, we ought to do it right. Uh, the idea of, of, of putting this on some bill that, that, that you know, is a, a trailer of some sort, rather than really giving some thought to the mechanism so that it will go through a, a regular review, I think is most appropriate so we don't find ourselves in the situation that uh, we, we're every 30 years, and it's subject to all these others. They're, they're auto. Uh, we've done that with federal pay uh, a number of years ago. Uh, it, it works. There's been a pay compression problem because of some other issues. But uh, clearly, and I, uh, I think that mechanism ought to be in place, and it ought to be adhered to. I would also, I have a number of, uh, of, of friends that sit on the federal judiciary who served with me in the United States Attorney's Office and other places. And, and this compression problem has also created a very major problem there uh, where we're just not, a, we're, we're attracting uh, candidates, but we're not attracting uh, really qualified candidates because of that. And the compression would help there too. But what's happened is sometimes we don't go through with it. We set the mechanism in place. And then for one reason or another, because it's tied to congressional salaries, we don't go through it. And I don't think anything we set in place should be tied to congressional salaries. That's an issue that Congress has got to work through themselves. Thank but you. all these other people should not be tied to those salaries uh, because I think that creates the same compression problem you have otherwise. Any uh, change in your position, Mr. Clarity? Uh, no, there's not. I think uh, I certainly could support 500. Uh, it's got to be politically, it's got to be tempered, obviously, with political judgment. I think you can make a case for greater than that. I strongly support a uh, some type of a review that that is thoughtful and appropriate, I think that would be a great deal of help in this situation. I now yield to the ranking member on the committee, Mr. Turner of Texas, for questioning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kentrell, I know. Uh, Mr. McClarty, I think you were the last to mention the problem of compression of federal salaries. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, the Congress legislative a freeze on congressional salaries, which also applied to the top uh, federal office, uh, top federal positions as well, in not only 94, 95, 96, 97, uh, there was a pay increase in 98, uh, none in 99. And in fact, uh, if Congress had not legislated that freeze and had allowed the the automatic uh, adjustment, the cost of living adjustment to take place, uh, if my math is correct, the vice president would be making uh, <laughs> the same as the president is today. So it is a, a problem that uh, we should address. The Obviously, the Congress has been part of the problem uh, in trying to uh, uh, deal with it, and it, I certainly think it reflects the political charge nature of this issue to note that for all of those years that I mentioned, the Congress denied itself and the other top level federal officials a pay raise. And I guess the question that I would want to ask each of you is, is what's the best way to explain this problem to the American people? We're going to hear on one of our next panels uh, testimony that uh, shares some results from a Pew Research Center poll which basically um, says that the people of this country understand the president's entitled to a pay raise, but uh, the majority of them think it's somewhere in the range of uh, ten to twenty thousand dollars. And in fact, there appears to be virtually no support for a doubling of the president's salary. So, uh, to help us through this uh, issue, which obviously uh, is fraught with uh, political minefields, uh, would any of you like to offer up a suggestion as to how to? best make the case for this kind of change. 
Ambassador, would you like to start helping me on that one? It was very difficult. There is never a good time for a congressional pay raise. Uh, there's never a good time for a pay raise in general, politically speaking. And it's, it's very difficult to convince the American people that one is deserved. Part of that, I think, Congress brings on itself by raving and ranting against a pay raise and, and not giving the, the, the kind of uh, respect that the institution itself has. And I think that carries over to the American people and the respect they have for the institution. It was attempted a few years back to, to make an independent method of, of assessing what congressional salaries and other salaries should be, and they come through automatically. The problem is the appropriations process denies that. It seems to me some sort of independence uh, that would equate an independent review and, and assessment of salaries that's mandated that would equate to the independence of our federal judiciary in the same respect that it is, re it is accorded needs to be put in place. But it's, uh, it's going to have to be something that's proactive. It's going to be, have to be something that you can constitutionally uh, mandate the appropriations process to, to fulfill, uh, whether it's in some form of a trust fund, I'm not sure. But I think that you're, going, you're never going to get around the political obstacles as long as Congress goes through the regular uh, annual debate on a pay raise. So some sort of independent mechanism is the way that I think you go about doing it. Thank you. General Haig, you have a suggestion for us? I just suggest to you, uh, you've had every member of this panel uh, recommend uh, 500 uh, or 400. Uh, I don't think it's the job of the Congress any more than it is the, of the president to, to, to be <laughs> dictated to by polls. I think the American people are ready to take this if it's given to them with the factual data that was presented here at this hearing. And if it's done and the Congress moves courageously, they will because their own ox is being gore, as we very clearly understand. And, and I, think, I think it'll get through. Thank you. Mr. Hartman, you have a suggestion? I have nothing to add. Mr. Duberstein? Um, I want to echo what General Haig said. I think this is not a business of polling. This is a question of equity. I think the American people will, in fact, support a significant pay raise for the President of the United States. I don't think the selling job has been done as far as being no pay raise since 1969, and that's why I use the examples that I used. I think people will understand 10 or 20,000, but only in the sense of a year or two. But if you talk about 30 years, I think people will understand the fundamental change in the office of the presidency with C-SPAN, with cable television, with the 24-hour news cycle, et cetera. And I think it is not a losing issue. Governor? Uh, Mr. Turner, I, um, I think it is an issue that the public can be educated on. But going back to your poll, I suggest, like all polls, it has a problem in the question, not in the answer. And the question was probably, the President of the United States makes $200,000. What do you think a good pay raise for the President would be? 20000 is an absolutely appropriate answer to that question. But if the question was not even how much should we pay this President of the United States, but how much should we pay the next President of the United States? What is a fair salary for the next President of the United States? I suggest to you the poll would probably come in with numbers around a million dollars. And uh, so with all due respect, uh, there are polls and there are polls and there are polls. $500,000, I think, is a good compromise. I think that's an educable number. And uh, I commend the, the committee for having the hearings, and I think you'll have no trouble selling that point. Thank you. Mr. Skinner? Well, in, uh, every once in a while in government, you've got to follow the slogan of that I think Nike has, just do it. Uh, and uh, I think this is one of those issues that if we sit around waiting uh, for uh, all the input and everybody else, 
and full education, you'll miss this opportunity. I mean, this is really the first realistic time in 30 years that Congress has addressed this. And I think you've got the ball moving. You've got clear, certainly a record. And I think, if, under Governor Sununu's point, if you'd also said uh, the President of the United States, the Office of President of the United States salary has not been raised for 30 years, uh, how much do you think the next President should, should make uh, if we're not going to raise it for another 30 years? Uh, I think you might get a far different answer than $20,000. Thank you. Mr. McClarty. Uh, I would agree with the comments that have been made. I think it should be approached in a very direct, straightforward manner. Uh, I don't think most people realize the President's pay has not been raised for over 30 years. So I think that's the first point. And I think common sense and, and equity will, will be um, uh, strong, um, strong points to make. It certainly should be done in a bipartisan manner. I think that will go a long way in terms of uh, how people react to the proposal. Mr. McClarty, I, and I know to most Americans uh, and to all of us, $200,000, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't make that kind of money. But one of the issues that I raised in my opening remarks was my belief that the President's salary uh, should be sufficient uh, so that he would not be susceptible to corruption. And you've been there most recently of this panel. It seems that our current president has had uh, a lot of expenses come his way for various reasons. He's had to raise money privately to cover legal costs. Uh, could you describe for us, just from your own personal experience, the kind of pressure that exists in the White House today with regard to finances for a president and a first lady or first spouse? I don't think uh, some of the uh, pressures are, are singular, Mr. Turner, to this administration. I think it's probably been building over the last several terms of the presidency. Uh, I think clearly uh, the disclosure is, is one of the areas that I noted, and I think uh, uh, certainly from an uh, overview or, or legal side, that the expenses have grown over the years, but I think we have seen that growing over the years. It's a very real number, uh, but I think, and it's a very large number. But I think it also, of course, reflects not just the president, but those that serve in government as well. And that was part of the point I was trying to make. I don't think this, this particular measure should, should have as its focus uh, the um, uh, legal bills or anything of that aspect. I think the cost of, of public service, of serving in public service, should be the focus of that. But there's no question the point you raise is a valid one. It is expensive not only in terms of real cost, in many cases moving to Washington, it is certainly expensive in terms of opportunity cost. And I think the last thing we want, whether it be at the presidential level or anywhere in the government, is to have any kind of, of um, incentive for less than fully appropriate conduct. And I think in the president's case, you also have seen with President Carter, there's great uh, ability to do great uh, public, uh, public works after uh, a tenure as president. So I think that should go into play here as well. And there are other presidents as well, not just singling out President Carter. But there's no question there are stresses. I think uh, Mr. Duberstein and others have pointed out many of the reasons for that, and they will, in all likelihood, continue to grow, whether we have a Democrat or Republican in the White House. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now yield, uh, now yield time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ken Jorsky, for the questioning of witnesses. Uh, do, does anyone on the panel know what the president's salary would be today if we took all the inflation over the last 30 years into consideration? Have they done the math on any of that? We have it 30, on the next panel. The last 30 <laughs> okay. years, sir? Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, when, when I think of the 70s, when we had double-digit inflation, just, just where, where we'd be today if every year we increased the present size. A little yeah. under a million. Yeah, a little right. under a million. Uh, the other question, uh, are any of you, and I think the governor would be familiar, the presidents of some of our major universities, <laughs> Uh, it, it would it be reasonable to say that they are certainly in the four or five hundred thousand dollar range, and some higher, I believe. And some higher. I, I know that in one of our universities in Pennsylvania is so high the legislature is not allowed to know it. <laughs> uh, We're paying coaches a million a year. Some of the coaches. Whether they're all, all packages in, coaches at major institutions will have a total compensation package of a million to a million two. Well, and it seems that those uh, that criticize this the most appear on what we call the media on a regular basis. And it seems to me that we uh, in Congress should think about making sure that 
maybe if they appear on a, a, a licensed television or radio station, the commentator's salary should be disclosed. So that when you have a, uh, a, a, a newscaster being paid seven, 10, 12 million dollars a year, it seems hypocritical for him to start the ball rolling against these unusual high political salaries. Be, and mostly people are completely unaware of the fact that these celebrities, if you will, media celebrities, are paid this extraordinary amounts of money. Uh, I don't know who made the observation. I, I think my good friend, Mr. Jones, in terms of how we tend to beat ourselves to death up here. Uh, now, you'll, you'll be a pleasure to know sometimes we get down, there's only one or two members of Congress, but invariably somebody's running for the senator, somebody's running for governor, or somebody sees a political opportunity to get out there and, and uh, do a job on uh, public salaries, whether they be judges or Congress or the president. Yeah. And it will happen again, but I tend to agree with the panel, Mr. Chairman. We, we just have to bite this bullet, and we shouldn't play around with the fact that, quite frankly, I think we ought to pay the president of the United States a million dollars a year. If, if, if anyone who isn't worth a million dollars a year to lead this country probably shouldn't be president of the United States. And the type of dedication and activity, as we all know, it's a 25-year commitment to rise the level to aspire to that office. It's not just uh, a convention meeting and rising up, as we all know. Those conventions don't meet that way. Uh, it's a long, protracted, and loss of income in private life that uh, people would have. Uh, on the, the, the judiciary level, I've, I've been uh, a, a little annoyed with the idea of my good friends in the legal profession who uh, entertain seven-figure salaries on a regular basis, and they're very difficult to persuade to, to sit on the bench, whether it be a district court, appeals court, or a Supreme Court for that matter. And it seems now almost uh, the only people that, that will decide to sit on the Supreme Court already have a mass sufficient uh, money that they are relatively independent in several millions of dollars in net assets. And that's unfortunate because some people won't have that opportunity and therefore have to make terrible choices. Uh, talking to this president and being familiar with tuitions, uh, I'm sure Stanford University is not cheap. I'm, and, and to my knowledge, uh, elected officials don't get the opportunity to having scholarships, et cetera, so they pay the full freight. And that's probably $150,000, $160,000 after tax income just to educate one child. If a president has three or four children, as I think the next president may have, <clears throat> not to state who that may be, uh, <laughs> that, could, that could be a very difficult uh, expenditure. Uh, how, how would, what, what, I, I'm more interested in the president's people around him. Assume we pay a uh, uh, million dollars a year to the president or half a million dollars a year to the president. How are we going to attract men of your caliber to leave public li uh, pu uh, private life and seven-figure income and come into administrations and serve for four and eight years and then sometimes have to spend a million dollars to defend yourselves with the uh, litigation now that is almost endemic to the system and I think will continue. And, and, and w the one other thing I would like the panel to read in, have you given any thought and should we think about giving uh, an exemption or a moratorium to civil lawsuit to the President of the United States while he serves in office. So these extraordinary uh, uh, <coughs> expenses aren't, uh, aren't required to be incurred. When quite frankly, uh, I would say anybody that stands in a uh, rope line who gets to shake the hand of the President could sue the President for assault and battery if they were if they were willing to go through that process. And it would necessitate hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in legal expenses to go through the legal process at this point. But uh, do you think we ought to also, while we're doing this, address the fact of just what type of insulation we should give to the office of the president and these inordinate expenses that are a new political phenomenon in our society? Let's start with Al and move down the panel. Well, with regard to your last uh, recommendation, yes, I think Congress should give some consideration to an appropriate constitutionally proper exemption, I mean, uh, uh, deferment of uh, civil suits against the President. Uh, obviously, Congress will have to do it if it's going to be done because the Supreme Court has ruled on this question. Uh, and so I think that's something Congress should consider. 
With regard to attracting people to other levels at the White House, et cetera, uh, I think the salary is important and it should go up somewhat. But I think you're going to have to change the attitudes about public service and the people who come to public service and their motivations. My experience is that people are truly properly motivated to serve the public when they leave private sector and come into government service. But when you fill out all the forms and when you uh, answer all the questions, the assumption is that somehow you're going to try to cheat, lie, and, and steal. And in order to prevent you from doing that, you answer a number of questions that leaves you open to tremendous legal liability if politically motivated suits are desired. And then uh, uh, secondly, you are required in many instances to divest of whatever you have accumulated for yourself and your family as opposed to a, a total blind trust or something like that. So I think the presumption that many people who are, would come into public service and would be asked by a president is that somehow they think I'm a crook and just going to try to cheat. I think that presumption needs to be changed because my experience is just the opposite is true. I'd like to also add the observation that I, I think I'm the only one at this table that ran for president, or at least tried. <laughs> and it probably cost me $2 million of my own personal funds to do that, despite the money that was raised. Uh, but it got into the lawsuits, the Federal Election Committee, which I think if, if you really want to look at something of uh, making lawyers rich for nothing, that's a very, very good thing to look at. But having said that, I know there are candidates running this year who are willing to give 20, $25 million of their own personal money for the, for the opportunity, the honor, and the challenge of leading this land. And so I don't think the money side of it is, is nearly as important as ensuring that the incumbent can live in dignity, educate his children, as you quite rightly pointed out, recognize that these are very dynamic costs that must be assessed regularly, and that we sure that the incumbent is, is paid in a way that he can uh, go into that office and not draw down on the assets he brought into the office. That gets right back to what, what you said, uh, Mr. Turner, about, by God, it's not a rich man's club. It's got to be a, an office open to every individual in this land. So I just don't want to get it too astronomical because I'm afraid if your million dollars went up there, you'd get the regurgitation that <laughs> we're talking about, although it is just. Well, I, I, I would make the observation that government in... Want to get the microphone a little closer? Thank you. I would make the observation that it seems to me that right now we're in a period of our history in which government service is at a rather low ebb in public opinion. Uh, I, I won't say that the government service is necessarily to blame for that. But I do think that when you start waving around half a million dollars or a million dollars in the faces of ordinary people, they aren't going to like it. And I don't, I, I mean, we've made very persuasive arguments here for why it, it's necessary in the case of, of government people and of particularly of the top level of government people. But, uh, I'm not, I don't think the public's going to buy it, not in their present mood. If you want to get an Eisenhower in here and then propose it, you might succeed. But I don't think you're going to succeed right now. Mr. Duberstein. Congressman Kanjorski, I don't think uh, salary is the issue. But government service shouldn't be a punishment. Government service should be the highest calling. The idea of attracting people who have to run the maze of a confirmation process in the other body 
deters so many now. I'm not talking about the elected officials. I'm talking about those of us who have been appointed either confirmable jobs or non-confirmable. The price you pay, your family pays, is astronomical. But it's worth it if you can make a difference. That's what we were all in here for. If the salary had been $10,000 higher when President Reagan asked me to be his chief of staff, it wouldn't have made any difference. It's the opportunity to make a difference, to serve. That's what it has to be all about. I think Ken makes a very important point. Uh, when I had to go out and solicit <coughs> potential members of the cabinet for President Bush, the issue was never salary. The issue was abuse in the public domain. And, and therefore, that is the biggest deterrent to participation in government by good people. I, I don't mean to suggest that salary is not any factor at all. Uh, I remember my news conference in, in May of 88 when I announced I wasn't going to run for a fourth term, and the press asked me how come. And I, my answer was, when you send $20,000 a year to MIT and $20,000 a year to Stanford and $20,000 a year to the IRS, it doesn't leave much from a $60,000 a year salary. <laughs> so there are times uh, in which the salary issue is an important one. But in terms of, of what we're addressing at the cabinet level and the president, I, I don't think it is the issue. Mr. Skinner. Well, I have uh, done it twice. Uh, first time, I uh, took a 60, 80 percent pay cut, and the last time about the same. But every time I did it, I knew I wasn't going to do it for life. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to be excluded from having an opportunity to go back to the private sector to make up for the costs, as well as maybe even to, frankly, to enhance one's position. Uh, and so I, I think in recruiting people at the very top for a relatively short period of time, it's not a problem. Uh, I do, however, agree with your comments about the judiciary, and as the only, I guess, practicing lawyer, at least at the table here today now, uh, I, uh, I know, and having been the United States Attorney and been recruited for that job, uh, it wasn't. But I again knew I was going to go back to the private sector. When we recruit judges, we recruit for life or good behavior. And only three, I think, have been removed in the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, we are recruiting good judges uh, who are good lawyers. Uh, I think it is very difficult, except for the Supreme Court, to recruit great lawyers with great experience uh, for the judiciary. Uh, and I think it is very difficult to keep great judges on the judiciary uh, for an extended period of time uh, because of the opportunity that exists or the impossibility to educate because we're recruiting them at a time when they have all these expenses building up. Uh, and as we recruit younger candidates or younger candidates run for the presidency, uh, they have educational expenses that uh, some of the others don't. Uh, so I think as, as all of this plays a role, we've got to give them the ability at least to minimally meet the expenses that Governor Sununu and others talked about. I believe we have uh, two or three issues related here. One is <clears throat> the presidential pay, which I think really just goes to the appropriateness and dignity of the office, which we've all spoken to. I think, secondly, it is clearly more difficult to recruit people of standing, of accomplishment, uh, from the private sector, whether they be from industry or, or uh, academia or, or wherever, to serve than it was five, ten years ago. I think that probably, regrettably, will continue. Uh, perhaps there's some uh, way we could, could at least evaluate some of the filings required, but I think all of us are for transparency and openness, and none of us would, would um, we'd want to be very careful how we did that. I do think the salary level makes a difference, however, in some of the civil servants and some of the younger people in government. Uh, not so much recruited at a cabinet level, but in a uh, working level. I think that does make a difference, and I've seen that time and time again where very capable, bright young people come into government and just really determine they cannot stay uh, because of the financial uh, uh, 
requirements or burdens of the responsibility. And I think in that case, this presidential salary does drive that equation to some extent. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me follow up on some of this. The compression problem, without question, does have a real effect on the ability and capacity of an administration to staff the executive branch, particularly with the uh, political appointees. And uh, I certainly remember that under President Eisenhower when the Secretary of Labor asked me as his assistant to go out and check these people out for your solicitor. There was a year and a half to go in the administration, and you face a real problem trying to recruit in the last year and a half of any administration. And you also face the salary problem. And I think the way your heads nod, you all agree that this is a problem we have to deal with here if we're going to get people for the last half of the administration. And I think the figures used to be that cabinet officers sort of stick it out for four years. Under secretaries, maybe you've got three years. Assistant secretaries are maybe two, two and a half years. And uh, I think all of you have faced that problem if you've been in your role as chief of staff. And uh, do you have any advice, further advice to us? I've got one more question. And, uh, okay, one more question. Retirement and how we deal with it. President Truman once said, and I think he's right on the mark, he said when he's out of the presidency, a lot of boards wanted him to serve on it and so forth. He said, they don't want me. They want the presidency. I think he's absolutely right. Now, the question is, if we pay the president adequately, if we tie his retirement or her retirement to it, uh, should uh, we say, okay, you've got that retirement, you've been president of the United States, the highest honor any citizens of the United States can give, can we say you aren't going to serve on private boards? What do you think? I know you've been on that, General. We're not picking on generals. We're oh, just saying uh, presidents. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I think you ought to be very careful about that because every president is of a different mold. Uh, some are older and have been through their careers uh, and hopefully will not forget that wisdom sometimes pays off. Some are younger and, and, and more visionary <clears throat> and have a whole life ahead of them when they leave the presidency. I would be very careful. I think we should look at the retired pay of the president on the same cycle that we look at his salary <laughs> on active duty. And there should be a relationship. But most presidents are pretty well taken care of if I'm looking at the figures that the committee gave us in preparation for this in retirement. And I think maybe a very modest increase is all that's in order. Uh, I think it's 150 some, and then it gets up with the uh, allowances and and Benny's up to a very substantial number with recent presidents. So, but it requires more. You know, even a public ex public servant is every day. I have five or six letters a day uh, that I have to answer and and send down. I have to have a staff to to handle for me. If if I were an ex president, I'd be getting thousands of uh, letters a week. This is a big burden, and we've got to handle it. But I don't think I'd want to put uh, any ground rules other than to link the two in a responsible way. Any other comments on this? Mr. Horne, I, yeah. would, not, I would not attempt to limit what a president does, either in public service or private service afterwards. Uh, I just think the act of doing that suggests to the public a veniality that is not there. And, and uh, I, I just would recommend that that probably carries more of a public service burden than benefit in the long run. Mr. Skinner. Well, I think that uh, the retirement should take into consideration his service and length of, of service to our government in many cases, and it should be an appropriate level. Uh, I don't think we should penalize him by giving his retirement less than what that person would have gotten had they saved the full time. Most presidents don't serve on any significant public boards. Uh, I think they've got plenty of opportunities, as we know, in today's world to, to take care of some of the financial responsibilities they have late in life and still have a comfortable life. And many, like President Carter and others, have decided to devote their time in a very, very meaningful way uh, in the public sector. And uh, they should have that opportunity. And I think a fair retirement program consistent with government 
retirement programs is appropriate. Well, in the 19th century, we had the problem with uh, many presidential spouses uh, had hardly any means to uh, exist and continue once their husband died. I mean, should we look at uh, that also? Well, I think we still have that problem with the federal judiciary. Uh, we allow uh, someone to retire from the federal judiciary for, and they get their compensation for life. They can serve as a senior status in a in a less active role and continue to maintain their salary and all that goes with it. But as I recall, their, the pension for widows is basically non-existent. And uh, that is just an additional price of public service that, that's unwarranted, in my opinion. Uh, we should treat, uh, treat people, uh, you know, consistently uh, as they serve in government. And uh, uh, I think in doing that, we ought to have a consistent, fair retirement program for all public servants. Uh, obviously, it won't be at the level at some of these huge, you know, programs that exist from the private sector, and I'm the beneficiary of one of those, so I, I appreciate that. But it ought to be uh, at a level that recognizes their contribution and allows them to serve out the rest of their life and their family uh, the rest of their life with some dignity. Mr. Duberstein. Mr. Chairman, I think um, on retirement, uh, on retirement benefits, uh, it should be looked at periodically as the president's salary is reviewed as well. As far as post-employment limitations, I would strongly advise not to do that and place anything, any uh, curtailment on the former president of the United States. Any other thoughts? Mr. Chairman. Yes. While we have this distinguished panel, may I ask something totally unrelated okay. to the hearing? We'll have one last question. All, right. uh, all of you have dealt with the uh, Office of the President and the Congress and, and the various committees of jurisdictions. Do you think this would be an appropriate time for the Congress to form a commission to reorganize the executive branch of government and the legislative branch of government and take the advantage of three living presidents that are still in existence and have that commission return sometime in the next term so that functionally we can line up the Congress with the executive branch of government. Have you found that frustrating in your experience as a chief of staff that your, your officials have to be testifying before seven or eight different committees on and, and uh, the games we play up here to draft legislation to get to specific committees and avoid others that are pit stops? Uh, do you think this would be an appropriate time for us to put a Hoover Commission together, both for the executive branch and for the legislative branch, do it together, get the advantage of your experiences now and the living presidents while they're here? I um, chaired a committee for the National Academy of Public Administration several years back on this very subject and uh, made some recommendations to the, in that respect, and I, would, I, I think those recommendations are still sound. I'm not sure that a, a full presidential or commission needs to be organized to, to study this. I think this is something your relevant committees in the Congress should, should uh, deal with on a regular basis, seek the administration's opinion. But uh, you put your finger on two of the most frustrating or the most frustrating problem is the proliferation of jurisdiction that overlaps and forces one cabinet officer to spend most of his or her time on the Hill testifying basically the same testimony. So, but I think that's something that Congress ought to look at itself. Well, I would yes, just comment yeah. briefly. We hear a lot about the power of the presidency. And having served as many as I have, I left that experience with my concerns about the limitations <laughs> on the power of the presidency which today are really rather out of hand, whether it be the courts or, more importantly, the legislature. So I would love to see the legislature examine itself and let the executive branch examine itself uh, rather than to get into a partisan uh, brouhaha that's also bureaucratic in character. But there, your question is very well taken and long overdue. Mr. Duberstein, and, uh, any comment, and then Governor? No, I uh, agree with Al. I think doing it separately, legislative branch and executive branch are the ways to do it, rather than forming one presidential commission. I agree. I think it is long overdue. 
I think it should be looked at. And what better committee of the Congress to do it than this committee? I, I'm tempted to say that you're suggesting we rewrite the Constitution <laughs> as of, as of in 1787. Go ahead, Governor. I, I support the idea of separate branch uh, review. Uh, I think, with all due respect to the question asked by Mr. Kanjorski, that uh, I, I suspect any Congress will be clever enough that no matter what structure you come up with, that in about two congressional cycles, they will figure out how to reparcel it out to the committees and create the same problem all over again. But in terms of improving efficiency and bringing government into a modern structure, I think there is a great need for it. Mr. Skinner. Well, I, uh, having served as a statutory cabinet officer of a pretty big department with a lot of different jurisdictions, uh, I did not find uh, the, an insur that an insurmountable problem. I was able to work with most of the committees. I did take probably a little more time than necessary. Uh, I, I did, you do become concerned, although I think General Haig said, is uh, are we really in balance? Uh, and have we, by the, the creation of multiple commissions, I mean multiple committees with multiple jurisdictions, have we kind of thrown the balance of powers, which I thought was three equal branches of government, <coughs> a little off kilter? And if a joint effort would solve that problem, rather than an independent effort, I'd all be for it. Because I think it is a good to visit on occasion whether or not we've got that constitutionally provided balance of power really in balance, and sometimes it gets out of kilter. Any comments, Mr. McClarty? Well, I think uh, we were asked to address a very uh, serious and heavy, heavy lift of a subject uh, in the one we've discussed. Uh, this is an equally, I think, uh, uh, serious one. I believe there's a more efficient, effective way to do it. Uh, the vehicle, whether it's legislative or joint, I think I would leave, leave as an open question. Uh, but I, I do think um, that there's got to be a, a bit more effective way than we're currently doing it, stopping short of rewriting the Constitution, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We really appreciate you coming here. We might have some follow-up questions, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, but uh, thank you. Your perspective and experience is a real help to us. And that's why we have the committee system in the Congress of the United States. <laughs> Be it weird in some ways. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You. Panel two will come Over forward. Mr. Ruskin, uh, Mr. Light, and Mr. Simon. I think you might have been here and you know the routine. And the routine is we first give you the oath. So please stand, raise your right hand. I swear that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Two. The clerk will note all four affirmed. And we will begin with Sharon Gressel, the uh, specialist in American national government of the Congressional Research Service, which is part of our great Library of Congress, and they are part of the legislative branch of the government, and we're glad to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other members of the committee, I'd like to just place a short historical context for our discussions today. I will not make a lengthy statement. In the previous changes of salary for the presidency, we had, of course, the first for President Washington. That was in legislation for the president and the vice president. That was the only time in which the salary was not set immediately prior to the change of administration. In 1909, it was part of uh, the 1873 and 1909 changes were both part of general government appropriations as is this proposal now for Treasury appropriations to change it to 400,000. Um, in 1949, it was legislation that focused pretty much on top official salaries, but it was taken in the context of a larger discussion 
following the Hoover Commission on the whole scheme of federal salaries. And in fact, our general schedule, which we have today, was created pursuant to those discussions in a separate piece of legislation. And of course, in 1969, that was a standalone piece of legislation. It only changed the compensation of the presidency. And as you know, we now are at a situation where the next possible change in that comp uh, compensation is January of 2001. Um, no one has mentioned the expense allowance that is available to each uh, to the president on an annual basis yet today. That is a sum of $50,000. It was set in 1949 at that sum. And at this point in time, it has changed as to whether or not it was uh, funds directly to the president and whether or not it was taxable. At the current time, it is to be used for official purposes only. Any sums not used for that purpose would revert to the presidency, and it is not taxable because it's not considered to be personal sums to the presidency. I won't go in, unless you want me to, to detail on what might be considered some of the specific perks of the presidency. We have touched upon the issue of the pension, however. That has been in place on a systematic basis only since 1958. At the present time, that pension is keyed to the salary of the cabinet secretary. When that salary is increased, so too is the pension of the president. And at current, it is $151,800. Um, along with that comes the staff allowance and office space as well as security. There is currently a proposal in the 106th Congress to make some changes in that system. When we are talking about the relationship of the president's salary to other federal salaries, I think that it's sort of interesting to look at how it started out. The vice president's salary, for example, was 20 percent of the president's. The chief justice's was 16 percent. In 1856, when members first came into an annual pay salary, that salary was set at 12 percent. In 1949, the vice president's salary was 30 percent, and the chief justice's was 25.5 percent of the presidency. The 1969 salary changes resulted in 31 percent differentials for the vice president and the chief justice. And while there's been some changes, for the most part, those two positions, as well as the speaker now, pretty much are on a par one with another and have traveled forward to the point where they are at almost 90 percent of the president's salary. And of course, the question then is, is there an appropriate differential between those salaries? Um, if we were to look at OPM figures, they are using a figure, an inflator of 3.5%, and that would put those three salaries above the salary of the president by the year 2003, which means, of course, if there's no change in 2001, we'll have a problem. Um, the question is then, do we keep those temp down and not change the presidency, or do we change the president's salary allow those salaries to progress, or is there a decision made that the salary of the president shouldn't bear a relationship to salaries of other officials in the government? At the current time, if you want to open the discussion of compression, the senior executive service, which is our, our standard core of executives both in management and in their technical expertise, most of whom 90 percent are career employees and not political. We have, in some localities in the country, four of the six levels of the senior executive service being paid at the same rate. They are capped out at level three of the executive schedule. The base rate for the senior executive service has three of those six levels frozen. It has not yet reached the general schedule. The general schedule top level of a GS-15 currently, depending on which locality you're talking about, ranges from 102,000 to almost 110,000 at the current time. The Office of um, Personnel Management has done a little bit of um, thrust in terms of projections. We'll get into that discussion on their behalf today. 
and that is if they took the 1969 $200,000 mark and they were to bring it forward based on the CPIU, they would estimate a little over $900,000 for 1999. If you were to take what has happened with the general schedule adjustments from 1969 on and apply those to the $200,000, you would get a little over $685,000 as salary. And if you were to take it in terms of the executive schedule of the cabinet secretaries, there you would reach a number of $506,000. One of our economists over in CRS took the different salaries at the different points in history and brought forward using a difficultly arrived at CPU, if you would, because those measures did not exist back in the um, 18th century. But they figure that the, the $25,000 salary would range, would be about $240,000 using a very base inflator. Um, as you said, we also re arrived at the figure of 4.5 million based on other counts. If you use the CPIU, you would take the $50,000 in effect in 1873, would bring it to over 679,000. The 1909 $75,000 figure would be 1.4 million. The 1949 $100,000 figure would be back down to 684,000 and the 1969 rate of 200,000 would be at just over 888,000. And that, of course, would reflect fluctuations in price costs and inflation and so on and so forth. But that just gives a, a bare bones. We talk about the Commission on Executive, Legislative, and Judicial Salaries and their recommendations. In 1969, it was that group which recommended the $200,000 increase for the President's salary. And the time was right, the climate was right, and that did go into effect through legislation. The 1989 commission, which actually fiscal 89 was the last time the quadrennial commission was activated. And their recommendation at that time was 350,000, as has been entered in the record today. Basically, that wraps up my statement, sir. Well, that's a very helpful statement, and we thank you for all the research and all those appropriate documents will be put in the record at this point. Mr. Ruskin. Mr. Ruskin is the executive director of the Congressional Accountability Project. You might, uh, you know, mention to us what is the focus of that group. So, sure. uh, Thanks. Uh, yeah, the Congressional Accountability Project works primarily on corruption in the Congress. Um, thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding whether uh, the salary of the President of the United States uh, should be increased. Uh, the President's salary has remained unchanged for more than 30 years since January 20, uh, 1969. The President earns a salary of 200000 per year with a generous pension, perquisites, a $50,000 expense allowance, living expense benefits, the befit a king, uh, plus a near certain prospect if desired of becoming a multimillionaire upon leaving office. The value of a presidential pension is $152,000 annually. Uh, in fiscal year 1999. Since the founding of our republic, uh, it has been customary for the president, who is the chief executive of our federal government, to receive the highest salary in the federal government, uh, as other top federal government salaries have risen to approach an unchanged uh, presidential salary. The presidential salary now increasingly functions as a cap uh, on the salaries of members of Congress and federal judges. Uh, some federal judges and members of Congress now criticize that cap. They complain of pay compression, at the top of the federal pay scale, they want to raise, presumably a large one. That's why we're here today. The real question for today's hearing is, does the presidential salary cap serve the citizens well? I think it does. The Congressional Accountability Project opposes a presidential pay raise, not only because the president does not need a raise, but because, more importantly, it would decrease the president's moral authority to govern, lift the salary cap, at the top of the federal pay scale, which restrains the energetic efforts of members of Congress and federal judges who wish to further raise their salaries at taxpayer expense. Of course, uh, the public does not clamor for presidential pay raise. It would be wrong if the president's salary were set so low that it discouraged the best, most honorable Americans for running for president. But to the overwhelming majority of Americans, 200000 a year plus enormous living expense benefits is a great sum of money. The president suffers no real privations. The president does not need more money except to pay legal bills. 
We have no lack of exceptionally bright and talented people in this country who would be happy to serve as president for $200,000 a year. Those people who would serve as president only if the salary were higher are less interested in doing service than in getting rich. We have no need for the greedy in the highest offices of the federal government. In fact, we ought to weed them out aggressively. Good riddance. Let them be the wealthy captains of industry or lobbyists on K Street. The honest pleasures of serving the public, of diligently attending to their needs and earning their respect, as well as a generous $200,000 salary, is adequate compensation for the president. It is mostly the people who have adopted the values of the corporation who call for this pay raise. But the public sector is very different from the private sector. This makes comparisons between the president's salary and a corporate CEO's a case of apples and oranges. The president's salary and benefits are furnished by the taxpayers, more than 99 percent of whom earn far less than the president. The taxpayers work hard to fill the coffers of the federal government. It is wrong for the differential between the presidential salary and the median Americans to grow the larger than it is because such a high presidential compensation package begins to look as if the president were taking advantage of the taxpayers. It erodes the president's moral authority to govern. To make matters worse, the presidential pay raise boosters, boosters propose a 100 percent increase in the president's salary. The raise is not to 250000 or 300000 or even 350000 per year, but a full doubling of the president's salary. Try explaining that to a worker who hasn't seen a real salary increase in a generation. Everything the president does sets the moral tone, moral tone for America. What tone will the president set, profligate, profligate or self-restrained? The country is crying out for leadership by example. The president draws a salary from a federal government that is currently $5.6 trillion in debt. If we are to reduce the federal debt, the upper reaches of government must lead by example and sacrifice for the good of our country. That means the president first. Our nation's frugality should begin in the president's home. Citizens are pleased when their elected leaders show some dignified self-restraint and humility and forego a pay raise. Their wallets are thinner, but their moral authority grows. This intangible virtue is very important. As I mentioned before, this effort to increase the president's salary is driven by members of Congress and federal judges who wish to lift the president's salary cap. Members of Congress currently earn a salary of $136,700 per year, plus generous perks, pensions, and benefits. Federal district court judges earn the same, and appellate court judges earn $145,000 per year. Many members of Congress and federal judges chafe under these salaries, even though they are lavish. In March, a wave of avarice swept the upreaches of our federal government. The U.S. Judicial Conference announced that it would, quote, vigorously seek, unquote, pay raises for the federal judges, and that it would also seek to increase the salaries for members of Congress and the President. At the same time, the public was met with news reports that some House members want to raise their salaries and cash benefits by as much as $25,000 per year. The presidential salary cap serves a useful public function in counteracting such efforts. It should not be lifted. This is especially true regarding its effect on congressional salaries. The President, members of Congress, and federal ju judges ought to lead by example and sacrifice so that their moral authority might grow. They will be the richer for it, and so will the citizenry in a way that is far more important than money. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate having your perspective. Mr. Paul Light is director of the Center for Public Service at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Professor Light. It's uh, wonderful to be before you again um, on arguably the most difficult issue uh, that Congress faces uh, regarding ultimately its pay and the President's pay. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about a subject uh, that's so important uh, and a subject that appears to be frozen in amber as we struggle to figure out a way to uh, deal with this effort to provide a salary that's commensurate with responsibility. As you have in my statement, which I'd like to revise and submit for the record, especially since it has been pointed out to me that there is some very good scholarship on this uh, question. Uh, um, well, without objection, all the statements are subject to your revision for another week. <laughs> Thank you very say. much. Um, I, I would say that I do endorse the effort to uh, raise the president's salary. I, I listen to hearings uh, and have listened through this hearing as we struggle for a rational calculus by which to set the president's salary. Is it uh, CPE? Is it some other? Uh, CPI, is it some other index of wage growth? Uh, is it George Washington's salary adjusted for inflation plus living expenses, et cetera, et cetera? But ultimately, those calculus 
the search for calculus uh, fails us because there really is none. It's a question of how we value the institution itself. Uh, once we've raised the issue of raising a salary, we confront ourselves with a uh, pressure uh, to talk about the value of this office, which no doubt everybody in this room uh, would agree has been tarnished over the last uh, period of history, and we need to address that issue. What is a fair salary to pay this, the president is less about consumer price index, less about uh, the recruitment of millionaires or not millionaires. It's about how we value this institution, and it's a symbolic gesture where we think this uh, great and import important office belongs. Uh, on the corporate salary scale, which most Americans would say we ought not to use, the presidency right now would rank number 785 on a list of the top 800 salaries. Uh, is that good? Is that bad? Is it an abuse of our authority to argue that the president should move up ever so slightly on that list? Uh, today, uh, Congressman, by raising to 400,000, we would move the president all the way up to position 670 or so. We don't intend that the president should be paid as much as Michael Eisner or the other CEOs at the very top of that chart. That would be an outrage. Some in this body and elsewhere in this country might argue that it's an outrage that Michael Eisner and his colleagues make so much already. But all we argue here today is a slight movement in the president in, relevant in uh, uh, relative terms uh, to suggest a greater valuing of the office during this period of extraordinary run-up in those salaries. In terms of the reasons for increase, one can talk about comparability. I think that's reasonable. One can talk about compression, the coupling of the president's salary to other important offices. That's reasonable. Uh, one can talk about the impact of pay on public service, but I'd argue to you that there's very little data to suggest that pay is a motivator for the distinguished public servants who serve in this city and elsewhere in this country. Ultimately, for me, it's the symbolic impact of valuing this office properly during a period of significant run-up in other offices, and most Americans actually acknowledge this. They do believe that the president's salary should be raised rather more frequently than once every 30 years. My caveats about my recommendation are clear in my testimony. Uh, we need to make general note that the higher we raise the president's salary, the more we move away from the experience of ordinary Americans, which is what my colleague Mr. Ruskin argues. Ironically, the general public reaction to the proposal for pay increases actually struck me as quite reasonable and more supportive than I would have expected given 15 to 20 years of steady decline in trust in government. The general division of opinion among the American public towards the increase is about uh, 45 to 45. When you ask Americans, as our colleagues recommended here uh, just a bit ago, nuanced questions about the salary increase, you do get some breaks. When you tell Americans only that the salary has not been increased since 1969, 49 percent of Americans say it's time for salary increase. When you tell Americans that the president's salary is currently $200,000 a year, the amount of support drops to 41 percent favorable. And yet, in this particular climate, 41 percent favorable is really quite extraordinary. I expected in the 20 to 15 percent, uh, 10 percent range, I expected to find no support. Americans tend to be moved, I think, here, if you talk about strategy, towards the notion that occasionally you ought to address this issue. Occasionally you ought to adjust the president's salary to keep pace at some distant level with what we're rewarding others in this country. Uh, while at the same time, the American public is also telling us, don't let the president get too far away from us. Don't let the president move so far away that he or she won't know what a grocery store scanner is for. At any rate, uh, we have the data from the Pew Research Center for the People and the Press to peruse and discuss, if you wish. My conclusion is that, uh, symbolically, we've raised the issue now. We need to move forward. That by not acting, we'll send a powerful signal not to the public servants who seek the presidency. Lord knows several of them, uh, a 200,000 pay increase would be rather somewhat of a rounding error in their household budgets. But because we've uh, made a symbolic statement here uh, that we value the institution, and that's why in my testimony, without going into it, I suggest that perhaps we ought to link the presidential pay increase with other ways of burnishing the prestige of this great office, including campaign finance reform. But I know I'm preaching to the choir on that issue, and I shall be silent. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you. Uh, we always enjoy your testimony. Uh, Mr. Donald Simon is the acting president of Common Cause. Mr. Simon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on the views of Common Cause regarding uh, a salary increase for the president. 
Common Cause has always taken a keen interest in the issue of compensation for public officials because we strongly believe that the public should be the sole source of compensation for public officials, a belief that reflects our deeply held view that public officials should be accountable and beholden exclusively to the public whom they are privileged to serve. We also strongly believe that our government officials should be paid an adequate salary commensurate to their vital responsibilities as our nation's leaders. For this reason, we have in the past supported pay increases for members of Congress and other government officials. In the 30 years since 1969, when the President's salary was last raised, the Consumer Price Index, as others have noted, has increased by approximately 350 percent. Private sector wages have climbed, compensation for our nation's corporate executives has soared, and salaries of other high-ranking officials in all three branches of the federal government have increased to an unprecedented percentage of what the President makes, now 88 percent in the case of the Vice President and the Speaker. As a result, it is our view that the President's current salary no longer reflects the high place of office in our nation. It no longer compares as favorably as it should to salaries of other federal officials, and it threatens to cause compression in salaries throughout the federal government a phenomenon that in the past has caused serious problems in recruiting and retaining talented and experienced individuals in federal public service. For all these reasons, Common Cause strongly recommends that Congress act now to significantly increase the President's salary. Now, there are several ways to approach the question of how much the increase should be. One approach would be simply to apply increases in the Consumer Price Index to the President's salary since the last adjustment in 1969. This increase, approximately 350 percent, would result in a presidential salary of about $900,000. Another approach would be to reset the President's salary relative to congressional salaries at the same differential it was set at in 1969. Then, congressional salaries of $42,500 were set at approximately 21 percent of the President's salary of $200,000. Applying the same adjustment today, the President's salary would be increased to $640,000. Although each of these calculations is supported by some logic, they re both result in salary adjustments that would probably be higher than what the public would accept as appropriate. We believe a simpler approach is just to do again what Congress did last time it faced this question after a long hiatus which is to double the President's salary. Now, doubling the President's salary to $400,000 is uh, certainly a significant increase, but we do not believe this increase is too great. Uh, this figure approximates the recommendation of the 1989 Quadrennial Commission to raise the salary to $350,000, and if cost of living adjustments since 1989 are taken into account, that recommendation today would approach $400,000. The $400,000 figure, we believe, also reestablishes an appropriate differential between the President's salary and that of the Congress and other high-ranking federal officials. It would also alleviate the problem of com compression in the salaries of other federal employees, and it would again set the President's salary at a level that clearly reflects the importance of the office as compared to the salaries paid to other public officials. Finally. It's important that Congress create a statutory mechanism to provide for more frequent, more regular, and more modest increases in presidential salary. The president's salary should not be increased only once every three decades and then under extraordinary pressures and by extraordinary amounts. Congress instead should add the president's salary to those of other high-ranking federal officials, including Congress, which are periodically adjusted for inflation in order to make increases in presidential salaries more routine. Now, admittedly, the mechanisms to produce regular, modest increases for congressional salaries have not worked entirely as intended, but they have resulted in more frequent and reasonable pay raises, 12 increases since a congressional pay mechanism was initially established in 1969, than has been the case with the presidency, which has been afforded no salary increase whatsoever over the same period. In sum, Common Cause strongly urges Congress to significantly increase the salary of the President at this point by doubling it from its current amount, to enact the increase now so that it can take effect when our next President assumes office, 
and to create a regular legislative mechanism to avoid lengthy periods in the future without an increase. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, now I'll yield to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Turner, to begin the questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Light, in your uh, testimony, uh, in your written testimony, you mentioned in a little more detail the results of the Pew Research Center survey uh, than you mentioned in your oral testimony. Uh, reading your testimony and the details of that, uh, that survey, it would seem that the American people uh, agree with Mr. Ruskin. Um, Am I correct in reading that I believe one of your statements here is we can only surmise that there would have been virtually no support for an increase of $200,000. Is that what the Pew study showed us? Well, I can't speak for the, the fine scholars at the Pew Research Center as an interpreter of public opinion. When uh, the respondents were asked what size of increase uh, they'd be comfortable with, uh, there was no support at all for anything in that range. Um, I read in the general uh, result um, that there is support for some sort of increase, well rationalized and well argued. But when you start asking Americans sort of what a standard increase might be, the notion of a $200,000 salary increase is beyond the realm of uh, most respondents to uh, endorse. There would have been no one who said uh, 200,000. It just would have been beyond the pale. Now, when you ask them, uh, the, when you tell them that the president is currently making 200,000, and do you support the notion of a uh, doubling of the pay? Um, actually, 41 percent in the Pew Research Center sample said yes, and I found that to be an extraordinarily high response. So, as as we know from uh, public opinion research, sometimes uh, the way the question is worded and presented. Uh, produces a different result. I find in these data more support for the increase than I expected. But in the specific question that uh, you point to, uh, significant problems when you actually ask Americans how much to give, my goodness, a $200,000 salary increase is beyond uh, the comprehensible for most Americans who would be interviewed in a survey like this. I noticed in your written testimony, you. you related that half of the respondents in the poll were first told that the president's salary had not gone up since 1969, but they weren't told what the current salary was, and that 55 percent of those said the president should get an increase. But when the other half was only told the current figure, the number that endorsed the raise fell to just 39 percent. So even, does that tell me that even advising the respondents that the president's salary hadn't gone up in 30 years didn't seem to help a whole lot? Well, actually, I have the data in front of me, and uh, the final uh, analysis by the Pew Research Center was that if the respondent was just told that the salary had not been increased in 69, 49 percent favored an increase. When they were told that the president now earns 200000 plus housing and travel expenses, and that the president's salary has not been increased in 69. Uh, the number who supported was 49, uh, 41 percent. Um, you know, some can take a look at that and say there's little public support for a pay increase. Given my, uh, my view of what might have been, I was kind of surprised by uh, the rather significant uh, support. I think you go forward and talk about this with the American public in terms of what the institution needs, not what the occupant needs. Uh, these figures vary to a, a rather a significant extent by whether you think the president is doing a good job right now and whether you trust government in Washington. You're going to get this wrapped up in partisanship and attitudes towards the current incumbent of office if you don't talk broadly about the, the need to make sure that the institution of the presidency, which Americans uh, of both parties and of various ideological leanings, support, that this is important for the institution itself. That's how I would talk with the American public about it. Well, I suppose it is true that if you're going to support an increase uh, in the salary, you have to look at it in terms of what the institution deserves, because I think Mr. Ruskin is probably correct. The salary hadn't kept anybody from running for office. That's correct. 
Uh, I'm not sure if it's um, what effect it may be having on preventing corruption in the office. Uh, in the earlier panel, I was trying to ask Mr. McClarty what his personal experience had been working in the, uh, the Clinton administration in terms of the financial pressures that e exist there today. Uh, some suggest that we may have a president who very well could leave office bankrupt uh, because of legal expenses. But um, it is important, I think, to be sure that a president does not have undue pressure uh, to cause him to want to seek funds from outside sources just to ensure his, his uh, financial future. Uh, and there may be some pressures there. But it does seem in the final analysis, looking at it in terms of what the office deserves, it may be the right way to do it. Uh, Mr. Ruskin, you placed uh, some emphasis upon the fact that you believed the President's current salary serves as a salary cap to hold down all other high-level government salaries. And I, I read between the lines that what, one of the things you fear is that if we raise the President's salary, somehow all these other salaries are going to be following shortly thereafter in an upward spiral and cost the taxpayers uh, a lot more money than just simply increasing the president's salary. Realizing that 30 years ago, you know, the vice president was making 60 something thousand while the president was making 200, and today the vice president's at 175,000, almost as much as the president. It does seem like we, we deserve a little larger difference between the salary of the president and the vice president that we have currently. Uh, do you have any historical? Precedents suggest that when the president's salary is increased, all these other salaries are going to shortly thereafter spiral upward as well? Or could we perhaps not, uh, couldn't we do something to prevent that from happening to assure the public that that's not what's going to take place here? Well, I, I think that's plainly the, the history uh, here that uh, once the presidential salary goes up, so as well do uh, other uh, salaries, maybe not exactly at the same time. But that's clearly what is uh, afoot here. Uh, this is primarily, you can tell, an effort by the federal judges and some uh, powerful members of Congress to get a raise. I, I, I want to point out that you know, congressional salaries are already so high that, um, you know, any increase in the congressional salary, I, I think, brings a decrease in quality of member of Congress because you get more and more people who are in it for the money as opposed to in it for doing service. I, I, I also want to note that, you know, mem many members of Congress re receive large raises when they, when they get to Congress. There was a study done in 96 by news, newspaper roll call that, that found that all but six of 73 newly elected House members will receive large pay hikes when they take office compared with their previous employment. Um, during the last uh, 10 years, House members gave themselves five pay raises. Senators gave themselves six pay raises. Uh, congressional salaries grew by $47,200, which is more than $15,000 above inflation. In 1989, the, the base congressional salary was $89,500 a year. It's come a long way from there. So gi given that history, uh, members of Congress don't need a raise. The president doesn't need one either. Ms. Gressel, how do you uh, respond to Mr. Ruskin's argument that the president's salary serves as a salary cap, and that if we raise it, then we're going to see all these other salaries follow right on up the ladder rapidly as well? I don't know how rapidly you would see them go. Um, uh, please get the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. In front of you. I think that it's fair to say that if the president's salary is increased, then that uh, provides an opportunity within which the salaries for other federal officials can be a little more flexible in terms of, of a rise. I would not fear that there would be a grand and rapid rise in the salaries of other federal officials. Um, Congress is constantly faced with a political expedient in terms of their own salary. And I think that if there were nothing else to put the brakes on that somewhat, that would serve. Um, as I recall, about the only time in history that you can look at the president's salary in conjunction with other federal officials' salaries all coming together in sort of a crisis point was in 1873 
when the president's salary was increased, that was part of a larger pay increase for many, many federal officials. And there was quite extreme reaction to it. In fact, there was an attempt to decrease the president's salary after that. And largely, as I understand it, the reason that they wanted to decrease the president's salary was because of the reaction they got to increasing the members' salaries at that time. But in terms of if the president's salary were increased today, would everyone else's salary take a rapid gain? I don't think so. I don't think that, that it would happen any faster than it would uh, just in the normal automatic mechanisms in place under statute right now. What do you think is primarily responsible for the reluctance of the Congress? Uh, and I've only been here two terms, but I noted in the last six years, in five of those years, the Congress has received no pay increase and has declined even a cost of living adjustment. Uh, from your perspective, what, what do you think accounts for the fact that the Congress seems to be even more sensitive in recent years to increasing its own pay than it has in years previous? A personal observation would be that it could very well be a combination of looking at the office of a member of Congress as an opportunity to serve and not one to which there should be a great deal of monetary recompense. And that in combination with, again, the political expediency of going to the constituents and saying, we're going to be raising our salary. Um, we've seen over time that it's difficult for members to really explain what the costs of serving in Washington are in terms of the two domiciles that they must maintain, the travel expenses, and so on and so forth. Um, some members have lost their election because they bought into a pay raise. You know, their history proves that out. And so I think that political expediency, it is a very value-laden, value, uh, shall we say, experience to raise a, a salary on the part of a member of Congress. But I, I think those two things in com com combination, one with another. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and uh, now yield five minutes to Mr. Kanjorski for questioning. Mr. Ruskin, your argument's interesting. The, uh, moral force goes with lower salaries. You think if we were to do away with any salary for the president, it would make uh, the office more respected? Absolutely I, not. I, I, I think that the president ought to be paid. Um, I think uh, there are uh, compelling reasons for uh, the president to be paid a uh, a fair salary so that they don't fall prey to the highest bribery uh, and that they're paid enough so that we can attract the uh, most honorable people to the presidency. Um, so well, what, what, what do you think of the uh, uh, activity when a candidate runs for president because they are independently wealthy, they'll announce they won't accept the salary and that becomes very appealing to the, to the electorate. They think they're getting something for nothing. I think they really are getting something for nothing when we allow people to politically mix the salary of the president or the salary of member of Congress, whether they're going to receive it or not. Would you prefer most members of Congress to have no salary? Uh, no, I think members of Congress uh, ought to be paid, though I think they ought to take a pay cut. Uh, and I think it was wrong. Pay cut now or pay cut from when they get elected to office? Uh, I, I think members of Congress are overpaid right now. I think $136,700 plus perks, pensions, and benefits is too much. Hey, you are familiar with the uh, practice of law, would you be aware of the fact that a four-year member or a four-year member of a law firm in Washington, D.C., a major law firm, exceeds the salary of a member of Congress or a member of the Supreme Court? Would well, that surprise you or disappoint you in no, any way? No, it, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, the issue here is not the respect that, that we pay to uh, our Congress or to our president, but rather the respect that the president and members of Congress pay to the taxpayers work exceedingly hard to fill the coffers of this federal government. I understand that perfectly well. Mr. Turner re refers to the uh, relationship of uh, potential corruption and salaries. Do you see a relationship there at all or not? A absolutely, yes. Uh, that's why we don't want to pay our members of Congress or our president too little so that they would fall prey to uh, 
temptation of bribery. However, I don't think that is a problem with the presidential salary right now. I, I don't think you can come up with evidence. You, you made a point in your testimony to say that there are eminently a, a, a large number of people that would clearly come down to Washington and serve as our president at the salary of $200,000, and I, I tend to agree with you because it has nothing to do with salary. But that's sort of an argument. There are an awful lot of doctors that will perform brain surgery at a much less price than a brain surgeon. Or don't you see the relationship that well, what we're trying to so. attract to both the presidency and to the judiciary and to other high appointed and elected offices, sometimes the best and the brightest if we can. And we're competing with the private sector at different stages of people's lives. I tend to agree with you that if you want to fill the, room, the halls of Congress with 28 and 30 year old lawyers who are just getting started in their profession, uh, the salary of a member of Congress appeals to them because it's about the same as what they'd be getting in a successful law practice. But if you're trying to get uh, members of the bar or people in the private sector who have in their 40s or 50s who have now gone into a stage in life where they're relatively successful, it'd be highly unlikely. I, I, I don't know that the chairman is, but we do have some former presidents of universities here. And I would tend to say there's not one of those that hasn't take, had to take a significant decrease in salary. And I'll, I, for the record, I'll say that I, I still don't earn as a member of Congress what I did 15 years ago as a private practitioner in professional law. And I, I, you come up with these statistics that say all our members of Congress are overpaid uh, and uh, presidents are potentially overpaid and appointed officials. I, I don't see that. I see what's happening is that those people who can afford to aspire to elective office, whether it be the presidency, or a point of office, whether it be a cabinet position, or sometimes being constrained with their personal net worth and finances. If they are independently wealthy, they have a much l more likely opportunity of putting in public service, as opposed to if they're just average people coming out of average works of life. And you're not making a distinction there. I'm sure Mr. Forbes has no difficulty coming to the presidency and accepting no salary, as Mr. Kennedy did. But Mr. Truman would have a very difficult opportunity to do that because he just didn't have the personal net worth to do that. I remember when Mr. Eisenhower came to the presidency, the Congress of the United States had to pass special legislation to allow him not to pay taxes on his book so that he could get a commensurate amount of money to uh, feel free to carry on the office of the presidency, which I think is a 24-hour-a-day job. I don't think I want the president worrying about his electric bill or his gas bill or his children's tuition. I'd prefer he'd be working about whether or not we're going to put planes in the air to bomb a country or whether or not we're going to attend to some uh, emergency in the country. You don't see those distinctions in your testimony. No, I, 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 uh, I, the main point that we're trying to make here is that, uh, look, $200,000 a year it, it plus uh, pension and uh, other benefits is a great deal of money. Uh, you know, I just don't buy the theory that the president is down and out on 200000 a year and, and is in needing of some kind of dramatic raise, just like I, I think that, the, you know, members of Congress are not down and out on 136 7 a year plus pension and perks and other benefits. Uh, so, you know, this is just a fundamental... Well, difference. they're not down and out, but you want your elected officials to be down and out. No, absolutely not. Uh, but there's no question that a member of Congress earning 136.7 plus perks, pensions, and perks, benefits. Perks, pensions. What, what are all these perks and pensions you're talking about? I, I don't quite understand. Well, do you, uh, you know, for example, uh, m many members of Congress uh, retire with pensions of 80, 90, 100,000 a year. Uh, members of Congress get gifts. They get excellent medical benefits. What gifts do members of Congress? Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Since See, 1989, that, that hasn't been a long life. I don't understand where you're, you're, I mean, I hear these things roll out of your mouth. The fact of the matter is, members of Congress, and I'm going to address members of Congress because I think you brought that into the issue. If a member of Congress were in business in the United States and didn't have the restriction of a $3,000 a year tax write-off, he could write off the cost of his living expenses in Washington, D.C. He can't do that. But if you as a business person came to Washington and had a second home, you could write that off as a business expense. So there's actually not a perk there. There's an anti-perk. There's a denial of that expense. Now, I know most members of Congress have to expend twenty to $25,000 a year to live in this community as a second home. And you don't put any value on that. Well, I, I think simply that, that 136 7 is, is, uh, is a great deal of money. And, and uh, I, I just uh, think that, uh, you know, you all seem to 
exist on a different planet, but back in planet America, uh, uh, $200,000 a year or $136,700 plus generous benefits is... Gen gen generous benefits so that we can address that. We've had the pension reform in Congress. To my knowledge, there's no one that can retire from Congress that served in the last 10 years that could ever get $89,000 a year. It would take Correct. you, uh, what, 65 years of service or something to get to that level. So, I mean, I think it's important that we take some of the emotionally charged testimonies you've given today and comments such as that out of the realm if we're really going to address this. I don't think that I'm suggesting that if we raise the president's salary, uh, uh, we're doing it to save him from uh, uh, hunger. But I think it is very essential that we send a message that the President of the United States, who to my knowledge is the strongest human being of exercise of power in the entire world, should be free of monetary considerations for his family and his household while he serves in the office of President. Certainly, uh, 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 to compare him to the upper 1% of the population in the United States is not unreasonable. Would you agree? To compare him to the upper? The upper 1% of the population in the United States. The upper 1% of the population in the United States earns in excess of what the President of the United States earns. Yes, but with benefits, the President is well in the upper 1%. It, it, now, what, what the, are you talking about the retirement benefit that the president? Well, with has? retirement benefits plus, uh, you know, plus the long list of uh, living. Well, expense we could do benefits. away with that, Mr. Ruskin. You, the point is, when Mr. Truman was uh, getting ready to retire and these benefits were put into place, it was done for the purpose that we wouldn't have someone in poverty living in Independence, Missouri, who was called a former president of the United States. And the only way you can overcome that, and quite frankly, most of the men that occupy, occupy the office of president are multimillionaires, so that they will be able to sustain themselves. But every now and then, we get a very talented person in America who the American people desire to make president of the United States, and he has to make a terrible selection and decision to spend 25 years of his life in going after the presidency and foregoing personal wealth, or to uh, end up without the benefits that we provide him, the minimum benefits, that he will put his family in poverty once he exercises the, the role of being President of the United States. You don't seem to, to uh, uh, put any uh, relationship on that. I'm trying to make it possible, if we pass this, that someone like yourself could aspire to be President of the United States. Well, I, I think you're just n not talking about the reality that I know. I mean, most. People, when they, when they are president and when they leave the presidency, they clearly have the opportunity to become multimillionaires when they leave, if well, they so I, desire. I was, In addition, well, don't you know, you members of Congress have, 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 have a pension of 152000 a year. Aren't you annoyed that a president of the United States will leave the presidency and agree to make a $2 million speech and that, that we may have to go and spend 3 or $4 million to guard his security so that he can earn that $2 million? Wouldn't it be much wiser to pay him a sufficient salary and pension so he would not have to engage in that type of opportunity? And potentially, or at least uh, 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 for impressions, compromise his office position of the presidency? Wouldn't you prefer that? Of course the president ought, and former presidents ought not to compromise their, their position, but given a $200,000 a year salary while they're in office plus a $152,000 pension while they're out of office, there should be no need for compromise. Gentlemen's, gentlemen's time has expired on the questions. Uh, are there any further comments from the ranking member? Well, we thank you all for coming. We deeply appreciate it. Uh, we will be asking the next panel some questions on compensation, which we would also like you to respond to, but given the shortage of time, I think we're going to do it by letter. And uh, please file it. It'll go at the record either in this point or in panel three's point, because some of them are basic national comparisons to be made. Thank you very much, all of you. Panel three will come forward, please. Uh, Ms. Farrakhan, Ms. Weissman, and Mr. Hoffrich Burr. If you would uh, stand, raise your uh, right hand. You 
you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that the three witnesses have affirmed the oath. And we will proceed with uh, Ms. Robin Farrakone, Chair of the Executive Compensation Advisory Board of the American Compensation Association. Tell us a little bit about the organization, and then uh, we all have your statements, and we've all read them. Uh, if you'd like to summarize them, please feel free to, because I don't want to hear them all read, uh, because we just don't have the time for it. But uh, we want you to make, feel free to make your key points, and then we'd like to open it up to dialogue of the members with you. So, Ms. Farrakhan. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to address the issue. Uh, as you requested, I would like to start with uh, a little background about the American Compensation Association as a context for my remarks. The association was founded in 1955. It's an international association with more than 25,000 individual members. These members design and administer employee compensation and benefits programs for their organizations. Our membership includes compensation and benefits professionals from Fortune 1000 companies, as well as other organizations of all types, sizes, and industries. And this includes people from government entities as well as educational institutions. The work of our members impacts the pay and benefits of every employee in the United States and has significant impact beyond our borders as well. The ACA is nonpartisan, a not-for-profit organization that does not lobby. It's dedicated to maximizing the effectiveness of total rewards to enable people and their organizations to achieve their full potential. As a result, my testimony today is intended to provide information as a reference point for the subcommittee as you consider this issue. It is not advocating for or against raising the president's pay. However, ACA is uniquely positioned to provide an objective, factual basis for your decision making and consideration. The first step that compensation professionals use in determining appropriate levels of compensation is to essentially establish a pay philosophy and strategy. Typically, this pay philosophy addresses such issues as external pay positioning to attract and retain needed talent, fairness of pay or internal equity within the organization, as well as a variety of other factors. And if we consider internal equity, you are faced with consi considerable compression, which has been discussed today. In the private sector, a CEO receives a salary of approximately 1.5 times the next highest paid position. Applying this multiple to the vice president's salary, the president would need to earn approximately $260,000 a year to preserve this relationship. The current compression between the president's pay level and that of senior officials is because the president's salary has not been adjusted since 1969. And as a reference point, most organizations review their salary budgets annually to ensure that they remain current, competitive, and equitable. Each year for the past 25 years, ACA has surveyed its members to measure changes in salaries. ACA projected the value of the President's $200,000 salary today as if it had an increased commensurate with all other executive salaries from 1969 to 1999. Calculated on this basis, the salary today would be slightly over a million dollars. ACA also projected the value of the $200,000 salary as if it had, had kept pace with inflation as measured by the Consumer Price Index. And we calculate the salary would be about $935,000 today, calculated on this basis. In addition, you may want to consider the external marketplace for this position, for example, the pay of other world leaders or executives in the private sector. In the private sector, for your reference, the median salary for a CEO of a large U.S. company is approximately $1.15 million today. When deciding compensation levels for any employee, including the nation's chief executive, it's also important to look at the total package of compensation. That is, not only the financial package, but the indirect components of compensation as well, or employee benefits. Indirect compensation elements include protection programs, such as insurance and retirement, pay for time not worked, such as paid vacations, and employee services and perquisites, such as Air Force One or the White House. The many perquisites and privileges while in the office, as well as benefits, should be factored into the equation for the president. There's also the psychic income, 
not found in many other jobs, as well as a substantial future stream of income. In conclusion, we, consider, we encourage you to consider the following critical factors in evaluating the President's salary. One, the federal government's pay philosophy. Two, the internal equity of the President's pay relative to other senior federal servants. Three, the erosion in value of the current salary during the past 30 years. And four, the significant indirect compensation component available to the incumbent in the position. While these are important considerations, the position of the United States President is clearly unique. Pay is a small component, and there are no formula solutions. Still, the principles I've outlined today should provide some useful guideposts. As an educational, not-for-profit, objective entity, the American Compensation Association would be pleased to provide additional information to help this committee formulate an appropriate response to this challenging issue. Thank you for, your, for the opportunity to assist. Well, thank you, because uh, your data are very helpful to us, and we appreciate that. And we're assuming we're going to have some of the same from the next two witnesses. Uh, Ms. Jane Weissman is consultant to Watson Wyatt Worldwide. Please put the microphone a little closer. It's pretty. It's not your fault. It's just the way this hearing room was designed. Thank you. Is that better? Move it still closer. Great. Uh, thank you. This is indeed an honor, and, and not uh, typically as a an executive compensation and senior compensation consultant, something that I do often, but uh, has really caused me to look at the congressional research information that you've assembled in the history and really put together what I believe to be a benchmark and recommendations really in a rationale for determining uh, appropriateness of pay of, of the president and uh, senior officials. Um, basically, um, I'm here to uh, present a rationale and really uh, have four broad categories of recommendations. First, it, I concur with all the other testimony we've heard this afternoon presidential pay should be set to be competitive with the level of accomplishment, status, and standard of living of similarly accomplished professionals. If you use that as a guide, some of the ACA recommendations, you then begin to stand back and say, then what are the benchmarks? Um, in thinking about benchmarking, how do you determine what is the appropriate pay of similarly accomplished professionals? You might begin to think about a proxy of benchmark occupations um, and work against perhaps some pay leveling differentials, inflation indices, uh, including the consumer price index or the employment uh, uh, change index to come up with a methodology against which to gauge appropriateness of pay. Um, and from my own consulting experience and uh, the issue I know best, I'm here to say that I believe that uh, to the extent that presidential pay is set below competitive market levels, it does serve as a cap um, to other federal pay levels and truly does impede the attraction and retention of the talented, not only elected officials, but career professionals that this country needs and deserves uh, in, in the highest offices. I would be here to say I believe that uh, federal pay levels are at a national crisis point uh, in terms of the ability to bring in the technical skills, know-how, and capability uh, required of, of present-day technology and required of uh, the issues that they deal with. Finally, the fourth point I would like to make is it seems counterproductive to put this in a political realm uh, at the change of every uh, term. It's very hard to separate this discussion from performance, as I think ACA would also concur is one of the issues that often goes into considering pay. I would fully recommend that some methodology be established as you go forward with this uh, recommendation that uses a, uh, an index or a process by which you gauge change and in the economy, change in pay levels, and therefore the appropriate uh, recommendation for uh, future pay increases. Basically concludes my testimony. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our last panelist on this particular panel is Mr. David Hafrikper. Hafrikper. 
Vice President and Managing Director of the Hay Group. You might tell us a little bit about the Hay Group and uh, what the focus is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you today. Um, the Hay Group is one of the oldest uh, compensation consulting firms in the world. Uh, we operate uh, uh, through a series of offices now in 42 countries around the world and conduct some of the most comprehensive studies of executive as well as uh, all forms of uh, compensation. Um, I think uh, you have uh, the statement that we prepared. I think that there are a couple of points I'd just like to reiterate and then move to the recommendations. We approach this as uh, something of a consulting project. What would be the recommendations that we would make to this body in uh, looking at the data and realizing that this is, in fact, clearly a political situation? Uh, we've all heard that if you took the CPI and uh, moved it forward, you'd be looking at a salary of in the neighborhood of $900,000. If you took CEO pay and just applied those indicators to it on just base salary alone, uh, you'd be looking at approximately $1.2 million just on base salary. When we look at uh, CEO pay uh, as, as a general kind of concept, and uh, I purposely, in some of the data that I provided to you, removed the very largest corporations in the world, uh, namely those over $10 billion, uh, which uh, is significant. Um, the average remuneration for a CEO in total is approximately $3.1 million. Now, that's made up uh, of a salary, of an annual incentive, of a long-term incentive program, as well as the benefits and perquisites. Now, the importance of, of talking about that is, is, uh, is relevant in this context. Uh, while it is clearly understood that people do not become the president for uh, money alone, uh, it is, on a measurable basis, the largest executive position in the entire world. On a measurable content basis, it's larger than General Electric, Microsoft, et al. put together. So when we look at the complexities of doing the job, we have to really understand what goes into it. And so, uh, while clearly uh, running the United States is not the same as running a public corporation, uh, it, is, it is worthwhile to visit those numbers and to understand what we are talking about. The movement of a salary of the President to the four to $500,000 range is the equivalent of paying the President at the 10th to 25th percentile of a CEO running a one to two billion dollar company. Now, to put that in perspective, I mean, when we think about the size and complexity of, of, of the United States, it dwarfs that size organization in, in every respect. So it's, uh, it's an important uh, avenue to look at. Another thing has been, uh, that has been discussed uh, today has been the compression. And compression is a very real phenomenon. And within the government, uh, there are jobs who, of their own complexity, size, and contribution, are worthy of $200,000 plus in their own right today on a full market value. So the compression is a, significant, is a significant problem. And it's not just historical relationships that need to be looked at. It's the fact that you know, those jobs comparably uh, found in other parts of the world would be significantly uh, would be paid more. There is, uh, besides the disadvantage that that creates, there is also one rule of uh, thumb in compensation that has proven true. And that is that the larger the compensation arrangements, and I understand that these have to be tempered by judgment and public will and so forth, but the greater is the pool of the people with the right set of competencies to do the job. And I think that's an important consideration when we think about the highest office in the land. So in summary, we would uh, like to recommend in our testimony four points for consideration. One, that the movement to $400,000 be at least uh, the minimum movement, and we clearly could support movement in the neighborhood of five. Um, 400000 would be 45% uh, of the current CPI adjusted rate and about 35% of the real market adjusted rate. So we're hardly. Um, making an egregious adjustment uh, over those 30 years. 
The second uh, piece of the testimony or recommendation would be one that was raised before, that this is um, uh, a process that should be looked at far more frequently. And we would recommend, again, that it be reviewed uh, once every four years. Uh, if possible, we would even like to see it reviewed uh, uh, earlier, but we understand the, uh, the, the uh, constraints on that. Um, but at least once every four years for two reasons. One is, I think, it would uh, certainly be more appropriate as a policy matter to do it that in that time frame. And secondly, I think the adjustments would start to mirror a lot more what people have seen in their average paycheck, uh, uh, the general public as well. The third uh, issue is uh, perhaps a little controversial, but that's the question of considering the uncoupling of other federal pay uh, rates uh, to that of the president. Uh, there is actually precedent uh, in public service for that occurring. Uh, in my own city, uh, my own hometown of Chicago, uh, that was done a number of years ago so that the uh, uh, direct reports to the mayor could in fact be market priced, realizing the uh, symbolic nature of, of the role of mayor. And lastly, we think that a formal compensation review um, as, as uh, outlined by my colleague, Ms. Faircone from ACA, where there would be a statement of what is the particular uh, compensation philosophy and how do we move the entire federal pay uh, schedule in a more orderly way, not just from a budget standpoint of how much is available, but rather from a hard look at what is the market uh, for the various positions. I thank you for your time. Well, thank you. Let me start with a question for all three of you, and this is the question that I want to ask the previous panel, but we'll do it in writing because we just didn't have the time. But what is the relationship that ought to exist between one's salary during active years as a CEO or as President of the United States and the retirement pay that follows that? Is there any particular formula the private sector uses on this? In general, we, uh, we tend to see uh, uh, in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 percent of final pay being represented in the, uh, in the retirement. And that would be all in, meaning, you know, uh, including uh, Social Security as well as other forms of, of uh, retirement benefit. Uh, Ms. Weissman, you agree on that? Yes, I would concur. Uh, I would as well. Okay. Uh, one of the questions, obviously, that comes up in this situation, I did mention it previously, and that was uh, the spouse. Uh, spouses, if they're female, usually outlive us all, but uh, who knows what's going to happen in the next century. There will be a f several women presidents. Maybe they'll all be. And uh, the question is, what do you do with the spouse in terms of retirement? Uh, that was the question that faced General Grant as he wrote his last chapter of his memoirs to make sure his wife could live at least a, in the semi-decent house that they had at the time in New York. So I'd just be curious on what guidance, if any, you or is that just the job of the retired CEO, usually male in this country, is that just their worry and not the company's worry? Any thoughts on this? Well, many uh, executive retirement programs provide for, for the spouse so that retirement will apply not only to the executive who served the company while he or she was alive, but also to the spouse. And it applies to a second to die kind of um, uh, format. Uh, in addition, we also see life insurance policy benefits working this way as well. Mm. Ms. Weitzman. That's certainly a traditional way to follow and probably is, is a, a good pattern to, to uh, think about. But I think that the uniqueness of the position of being President of the United States and it, while um, the spouse is not an employee, certainly is a figurehead and, and uh, begins to uh, cause uh, all of us to stand back and, and uh, think that naturally some, some provision does need to be thought of. So in addition to the traditional kind of coverages, I would think it would be well in uh, the purview of, of uh, the Congress to think through uh, surviving benefits and what, is, what an appropriate standard of living uh, would mean uh, for spouse of the President. 
Just to get two facts on the table, uh, and it was mentioned, so I didn't mention it here, but let's get them both in. Presidential pensions uh, basically are at $151,800. Uh, that's the uh, pension not only for former presidents of the United States, uh, but uh, th there's also those pensions in the judiciary and uh, in the uh, vice presidential situation. Now, the presidential widow, and there's only one uh, right now, uh, and that's Lady Bird Johnson, uh, is provided a $20,000 annual lifetime pension and franking privileges. That's one way to get your Christmas cards out, and I'm sure that's appreciated. But uh, that doesn't sound like too much. Now, some are going to be millionaires in their own right, some aren't. And the question is, uh, given the duties that uh, we impose on the first lady, and if there's a first man or gentleman or whatever in the next century, uh, the fact is that uh, that isn't too much because we don't pay them for four years. They get free work. To the people, and that is a tough job. There's a lot of things to do in the president's uh, chief of state role with all the foreign visitors and all the rest and the spouses that have to be taken care of. And uh, the first ladies have done a great job in this century, and uh, that's not very much to solve some of the problems they might have in retirement. But uh, I'd be interested in any of the thoughts you might have. Uh, obviously, what goes with the person when they're president, uh, that isn't to be matched in retirement. Uh, president Nixon, as I remember, dismissed the Secret Service when he was in retirement and paid the Pinkertons out of his own pocket and his royalties from memoirs and books and so forth. Uh, Herbert Hoover, when he was president, I believe, did not take any salary. Uh, so uh, we've had different millionaire situations, non-millionaire situations. What we're trying to do is get some rational way to think about the compensation world, and that's why you're here, because you do that every day of your life. And so we would welcome any thoughts. I now yield five or ten minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner, the ranking member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Farrakhan, I believe it was in your testimony when you applied the Consumer Price Index to uh, the President's $200,000 salary, which was set in 1969, and you said that um, if the salary had kept pace with the CPI, it would be $935,000 today. And I, I think uh, one of your testimonies, I think, shared what the salary would be if it just kept up with executive compensation, it was higher than that yes. by a, a little over a million dollars. You know, this is a difficult area because and, and, I think every one of us here in, on this committee and perhaps in the Congress, you know, we still believe that serving in public office is public service. And so we don't really expect to apply the traditional uh, compensation schedules of CEOs in the private sector uh, to public service. Uh, I thought it was interesting, uh, and there's a chart in one of your testimonies that really broke down, uh, I think, the $3 million average CEO salary into the actual salary versus the benefits versus the long-term stock options or whatever. And in that presentation, the actual salary itself was about 600000 or so. Um, it seems to me that perhaps the, the bottom line of, of, of what we've heard today is that the president's salary has not been raised in 30 years, and it deserves to be increased after that period of time. Uh, but how we get to it, obviously the testimony you've offered to us is helpful. Um, and yet, from a political perspective, in terms of trying to preserve all of these offices as positions of public service, uh, we are going to temper that, obviously, with, with that concept as well. Um, in terms of one of you, I forget who, who it was, made an effort to kind of evaluate um, a, a CEO's uh, earning capacity after they leave the position. Uh, and you, I, I can't remember who it was, but there was some reference to the fact that the president has 
some income potential after he leaves office as well. Uh, but how we get to it, obviously the testimony you've offered to us is helpful. Um, and yet from a political perspective, in terms of trying, trying to preserve all of these offices as positions of public service, uh, we are going to temper that obviously with, with that concept as well. Um, in terms of one of you, I forget who, who it was, made an effort to kind of evaluate um, a CEO's uh, earning capacity after they leave the position. Uh, and you, I, I can't remember who it was, but there was some reference to the fact that the president has some income potential after he leaves office as well. Uh, am I correct? Did one of you make reference to some after some benefits after you leave the position, uh, obviously. I made reference to it, but didn't quantify it. I see. I mean, it would have seemed to me that a, a president, uh, in some cases, may very well have substantial uh, earning capacity through uh, publications of books, memoirs, and things like that. But I think the, the important thing for us to keep in mind is that though we have to respect the office and we understand that we must acknowledge that the president is running a big business and deserves to be compensated for it, uh, it's still a, a position of public service that we want to somehow uh, maintain that concept as well. Um, so I, I think you've been very helpful to provide us the, the, the analysis that you've done. Um, I get a little nervous when I see these numbers about increases in CEO salaries over the last 30 years. So I sometimes wonder if they're justified uh, in terms of how they compare with average workers uh, pay increases during the same period of time. Uh, but Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any specific questions, just those observations. Before yielding to Mr. Kanjorski, I just want to note that the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO, have uh, given us a very interesting proposal as to the situation in the uh, civil service of, uh, and the failure to really uh, conform to the Federal Employees Pay Comparability Act of 1990. And uh, I will, in, without objection, will go on the record at this point, and I think we will look at in our final report on this, some of the uh, interesting suggestions uh, that uh, group has noted. I'm also going to put in the record at this point a letter from Joseph A. Califano. He served in both the Kennedy, Johnson, and Carter administrations, and uh, his uh, comments will be available. Uh, and I will also put in the record at this point a memo from uh, Gail E. Mackinnon, Specialist in Economic Policy, Government and Finance Division, re-presidential pay. Uh, uh, Gail Mackinnon is with the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. And we also have a letter here from Michael J. Lyle, the General Counsel in the Executive Office of the President, Office of Administration. And uh, his, uh, attached is Mark Lindsay's statement to his letter of transmittal on behalf of the Executive Office uh, of the President. And uh, let me just read the uh, relevant amount here, uh, where they note in the last 30 years the president's salary has eroded significantly in relation to the cost of living and salaries of other government officials. For example, if the president's 1969 salary had been adjusted to reflect increases in the consumer price index for urban consumers, the 1999 salary would be over $900,000. Had the President's salary been adjusted to reflect increases in the salary levels of general schedule employees in the Washington metropolitan area, the 1999 salary would be nearly $700,000. If the President's salary had been adjusted to reflect increases in the salary levels for executive level one employees, those are the cabinet, the director of uh, management and budget, so forth. 
the uh, 1999 salary would be approximately $500,000. In fact, by 2003, assuming a modest increase of 3.5 percent per year in inflation, the salaries of certain high-level government officials will exceed that of the President. That point, of course, has been made by other witnesses. And uh, it, uh, the uh, uh, Mark Lindsay statement goes on here as to if the President's salary is not increased before the next President takes office in 2001, the Constitution dictates that it cannot be increased until January 2005. By then, the salaries of numerous other high-level government officials, such as cabinet officers, may begin to approach that of the President. This is likely to exacerbate existing salary compression for senior government officials and judges, creating a disincentive to government service and reducing our ability to attract and retain qualified individuals. That, I might add, is a major concern in at least the last four administrations in terms of trying to get someone to, who has experience, who has maturity, who has some wisdom, and isn't just out of school, and uh, are they going to give up everything and come to be a federal judge, one of the most important positions in our society? And we need to address that, and hopefully this situation will be addressed. So uh, he uh, goes on to note that thus, given the erosion of the president's salary over the past 30 years relative to the cost of living and the wages of other government workers, we believe an increase is well warranted. More importantly, if not addressed now, this salary erosion and compression will likely spread to other senior government officials until we're no longer able to attract and retain the most qualified individuals to government service. And as I mentioned earlier, from my own experience in the late 1950s, you try to staff an administration in the last year, year and a half, or two years, and they say, what? i got to move to Washington? And, you know, I'd really like to do that, Mr. President, undersecretary, assistant secretary. Those are the people that make sure the administration policies are carried out and uh, are the ones that uh, run a good part of uh, the Washington establishment. So we need to realize what presidents go through on that situation. And so now I yield to five to ten minutes to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kanjorski. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to congratulate you for holding this hearing and taking this important issue up. I, I know from some of the prior testimony that we've had, uh, there will be some that take advantage of this uh, from a political standpoint or from an emotional standpoint with the average citizen because we're talking about an unusual set of circumstances where so we're caused to consider that $200,000 salary is not an acceptable salary. But I think the witnesses that testified on this last panel certainly uh, are, are clear in their statement that if we were to compare this in anything uh, in the private sector, we'd be talking in the seven figures quite clearly. Uh, I, I would just like to make the observation that uh, uh, too often our, our constituents are not familiar with some of the problems of compression and uh, pay raises in our, in our society. But most recently, I had the occasion to visit with some university uh, leaders and uh, national laboratory leaders. And some of the major problems that they're facing is the leaving of uh, uh, scientists and uh, highly competent faculty members who, in some instances, are on pay schedules, are actually paid less than their graduating seniors that are going off to uh, new jobs, and our failure to recognize that or to attempt to socialize income at that level is contradictory to our system. Our system is one that compensates for capacity and ability, and it is competitive, using salary as a competitive feature, not as much certainly in, in politics and in public office, but uh, I remember having the testimony of the Chief Justice one day. Uh, before our committee some eight years ago, and he was calling our attention to the fact that it is extremely difficult to serve as Chief Justice when your uh, uh, students that are under you in, in writing are leaving their positions to go to a salary twice what you are receiving as Chief Justice of the United States. And at that time, I think he called our attention to the fact that Chief Justice was being paid less than 30% uh, of the practicing members of the bar in the United States. Uh, 
to keep these things relative and proper in their perspective is extremely difficult. But again, I congratulate you and the majority for taking on what is a considered a, a tough political issue in this time. And I want to compliment the members and not delay them with further questions, but the fact that you came forward and gave us a perspective from the private sector is vitally important for us that have to make a political decision. Thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman, and the fact is we will hear a lot of demagoguery on this, both within the House and without the House, but uh, that's light. Uh, Mr. Turner, you have some closing questions. Well, I think it, it might be important to, to restate what we have stated earlier, and that is whatever the Congress does to change the salary of the President, that 200000 that has been in place since 1969, uh, it would not be effective until the election of a new president in 2001. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, this has been a very productive uh, hearing, and uh, we certainly have had a distinguished uh, group of uh, witnesses on all three panels, and I thank the chairman uh, for the manner in which the uh, subject has been uh, dealt with in a, such a thorough manner, and perhaps it has uh, moved uh, the discussion forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank you. Uh, I'm going to insert in the record at this point a short history of executive pay increases which came from the Office of Personnel Management, which many might remember was the Civil Service Commission. But I also want to read portions of a very interesting statement from James F. Vivian, who could not make it here today. He's the author of the only book that we know on this subject, which is The President's Salary, A Study in Constitutional Declension. 1789 to 1990, published in New York by the Garland Publishers, and uh, he published that in 1993. And uh, we really appreciate his uh, summary here. And uh, he notes the two, two in part, uh, the two recent revisions, those of 1949-1969, proceeded almost entirely from the uh, merits of the proposal. They serve to strengthen the standing precedents for doubling the existing salary, for retaining the separate travel expense allowance, and for acknowledging the goodwill of the incumbent president toward the succeeding administration, regardless of its as yet unelected identity. Taken together, the four revisions tend to suggest that certain minimum conditions must also obtain, among other minor observations. The supportive conditions include an ambiance of economic prosperity, national self-confidence, the laggard value of the salary as gauged by most familiar and ordinary standards and the control of both Congress and the executive by the same political party. The absence of this latter condition went far toward explaining the declension that had grown all too apparent, if not by 1988, certainly by 1992. Never had the salary, quote, been of less importance, unquote, Mr. Vivian concluded. Never had the difference between it and the next highest salary been more narrow. Never have others' salaries been proportionally higher in relation to it. A bipartisan consensus sufficient to overcome the obstacles inherent in an era of divided government can prevail. Should the proposed adjustment of the President's salary to $400,000 gain congressional approval, as I trust it will, one of my principal theses will have been destroyed. No matter, history is more easily revised than the salary, it would seem. There is, after all, a quite practical consideration looming. Without an upward revision, the presidency continues risking the dilution of an important distinction, namely the preeminent compensation in the central government. And we will also be asking, if we might, Ms. Grassley, come back and tell us a little bit about the uh, uh, salaries abroad. And uh, we just like that at this point in the record, and then we will close it out. What we're interested in is just some of the comparisons abroad. I know some are a lot lower, uh, but wow. they aren't the United States of America. And some are higher, and some are the same. Right, and we have no idea either the relationship of the so-called perks of their salaries, you know, whether they have housing or whatnot. These uh, data are based on a very informal telephone survey that was conducted um, in a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> Those which exceed the president's would be the chief executive of Hong Kong at four. This, the figures I'll give you are converted to U.S. dollars. So uh, the chief executive in Hong Kong would be $418,182,000 a year. 
Um, and that's U.S. money, not Hong Kong. That's right. Yeah. Japan, 381000 Panama actually is lower, but it's at $180,000. We thought that was sort of an interesting figure. Now, those are both the chiefs of government, aren't the they? The president of Panama and the prime minister of Japan. Right. That's right. And uh, whereas the president of the United States is chief of state as well as chief of government. That's correct. Uh, the prime minister in Singapore is at $496,941 a year. The president of Taiwan is $303,500 a year. Um, if there are any others in which you're particularly interested, the United Kingdom's prime minister converts to $165,000 a year. Well, that's very helpful. And uh, we're going to put uh, all your figures in the record at this point. Okay, so thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, we've heard some very compelling testimony today that has been supportive of raising the pay of the President of the United States. Clearly, it would be impossible to compensate adequately any man or woman who will next hold the most powerful and difficult job in the United States, indeed in the world. The fact is that the last pay raise for a President of the United States was in 1969. Surely few corporate chief executives would accept such compensation. I agree with many of our witnesses, however, that such comparisons may not be relevant. Few seek the office of president for its generous salary, because it isn't that generous, and many others could, if they're interested in money, go as was suggested in the private sector or other places. Nevertheless, being a millionaire is not a constitutionally endorsed requirement for presidential candidates, although a lot are simply for what was brought up uh, by many witnesses that uh, increasingly we have millionaires running for office, and that's fine. Everybody's got a right to run. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, uh, they don't need the salary, but the ones that aren't millionaires, and if they win, they need it. If they don't win, they don't need it. Uh, and uh, we just should be equalizing the amount of competition in our society by having an appropriate, fair, reasonable, effective salary for the President of the United States so they don't have to try to pull any punches while they're President, at least. And that's why I stress the retirement. Uh, it seems to me when you go around sort of begging for presidential library money while you're still President of the United States, that you might well favor the millionaires that are going to give you a million. And uh, that bothers me. And that's why I suggested earlier that maybe the retirement ought to be adequate so that you don't have to go on boards and all the rest of it to uh, try to recoup what it has cost you over the years. Presidents, regardless of their personal income, ought to be able to independently and adequately support their families. And uh, needless to say, a few college tuitions will, uh, were mentioned here today. And uh, since I go to one of those, went to one of those schools, I'm going to uh, just forget about that. But it is a very real problem when, as the current president has a child going to a prestige school, that does not come cheap. So let me just thank now those who have prepared this hearing. Uh, J. Russell George, who's my immediately left, your right, has uh, been uh, in charge of this hearing from the beginning. He's our staff director and uh, chief counsel. Uh, Matthew Ebert, uh, policy advisor uh, to him down at the end of the bench there. And uh, Bonnie Heal, the director of communications. Uh, Mason Allinger, the clerk. And for the uh, uh, Democratic uh, side, uh, the Faith Weiss counsel. And uh, Julia Thomas is our court reporter, as is Cindy Sebo. And uh, with that, I thank you all on this panel. And with that, we are adjourned.
Now here's a look at what's on C-SPAN 2. In a moment, Senator Robert Bennett on the military action in Yugoslavia. Then a hearing on federal prisons. Just after 2 a.m., today's State Department briefing. And later, a newscast from Serbian television on the situation in the Balkans.